do you know that as soon as I thought to myself, oh, I'll tell him that interesting thing about the trees at Blenheim Palace. As soon as I thought that to myself, I thought, no, don't. Because you, you just, you've got to at least spend 10 seconds getting your, getting your ducks in a row before dropping some fascinating historical fact. And lo and behold, I got it completely wrong. It was, of course, the Battle of Blenheim and the Duke of Marlborough that see the, uh, the troop placements at said battle reflected in the layout of the trees in the grounds of Blenheim Palace. So um, I, I, the huge number of people that, that rush to turn off their radios as soon as I inhale at 9.59 who accidentally heard that bit and have now gone to listen to uh, Mantovani elsewhere. Uh, they may carry into the day and forevermore, they may carry forward the idea that the Duke of Wellington <laughs> um, and the... Uh, Battle of Waterloo are somehow associated with Blenheim Palace. My, my apologies um, to them and indeed to you. 10.04 is the time. But it is to Blenheim Palace that our attention turns first this morning. It is there that Keir Starmer is hosting a summit that was, I think, convened by Liz Truss. Like, this is so funny, isn't it? This is so illustrative of where we are, or at least where we've been as a nation. It's a summit that was convened by Liz Truss who, of course, uh, professes to be staunchly Eurosceptic, although she was quite a prominent Remain campaigner. It's almost as if she doesn't know which way she's uh, going. Uh, uh, other much. She's, in, she's in Milwaukee at the moment, popping up at the uh, Republican Party convention, uh, cheerleading for Donald Trump. But, um, but I guess she's unemployed, is she, effectively? So I, you could, probably counts as a holiday. Uh, Farage is there as well, perhaps inevitably. Um, also taking a form of holiday, despite being the newly elected MP for Clacton. But but we digress. It is um, a, a, a summit convened by Liz Truss, and then the venue was decided by Rishi Sunak, but the hosting will be done by Sir Keir Starmer, who, um, if you haven't been paying attention, is our... Still, I think you use the word new, don't you? Is our, is our new Prime Minister. And I, I, I've wanted to do... Well, like... You know I'm fascinated by uh, European Union membership, but I'm not fascinated by Brexit anymore. Brexit was a, was a, was a terrible thing for the country. It was a, it was a, I mean, in the context of the time we've spent together, it was an oddly wonderful thing it, it, that we, you know, really got to flex our muscles and, and, and learn an awful lot about our own country and particularly the relationship between the media and the public and the way that people I had prior to 2015 possibly even looked up to could lie so casually or um, display ignorance so blithely to the point of, of, of self-selected national disaster, self-inflicted national catastrophe. Um, and and it, so in, in that sense, it, it it, we, we enjoyed the time we spent together talking about it, a bit like being on a ghost train, didn't we? It, but, but those days are gone. Those days that disappeared, I think, probably when uh, What's-His-Chop signed the deal that David Frost had negotiated. Boris Johnson also actually in Milwaukee at the moment at the Republican National Convention. It's almost as if they don't give a hoot about uh, the UK. But, but the conversation has completely changed. The conversation has completely changed, and and, and you can't we can't return to the days of what law. I, every now and then, someone pops up on the program when we're examining some of this territory and starts talking about sovereignty or laws, and and we get it's a bit like I mean Tom Jones being told to sing Delilah, isn't it? Or or, or um, I, I don't know, and, and, and I have to then sort of say, all right, could you name one of the laws that you actually look forward to no longer having to obey? And someone on the line who's never somehow been asked that question before goes well no, no, i mean all of them all of them or, or so just just tell me one thing that you believe has been improved in terms of your relationship with the law of this land that you uh that that you uh, voted for and, and of course nobody can they might start talking about sovereignty of course which is um a, a, a shorthand if you like for not really having anything else to offer and so the, the challenge of how we talk about a subject that is of enormous national importance and of particular interest to us uh, is one that I wrestle with. I, I don't know. Something happened yesterday that I think is really interesting. And when I set it aside, set it alongside the, um, the use of the phrase fire the starting gun on a reset relationship with Europe, uh, I, I think we're in a moment. I think it's a quiet moment. 
<clears throat> I, I, if I said to you, I don't know what the opposite of boiling a frog is, you would text me and say, I'm boiling a frog. But you would be deliberately missing the point that, I, that I'm trying to make. I mean a sort of slow. So I don't think we're firing a starting gun. Um, I'll tell you what I think, and then you can tell me what you think. The King's speech contained a phrase yesterday that I thought was really interesting, and which was, I, I, well, some people, some experts, the politics correspondent and the economists, e economist, for example, has described it as unexpected. But I think that Andrew Marr, as you would expect from uh, one of the dons of our industry, I think that Andrew Marr actually um, uh, unearthed this nugget in a uh, in an interview a few months ago but but either way whether it's unexpected or not there's a phrase i haven't seen before there's a phrase and that phrase is sovereign choice sovereign choice and what the king's speech says is essentially that ministers individual ministers will be able to unilaterally here's a tricky word unilaterally mirror future EU product standards, which are about to be updated, there's about to be a review in that in that area of uh, 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 EU product standards. So ministers will be able to unilaterally mirror them as a sovereign choice. Now, I think a couple of years ago, <coughs> I would start shrilly shouting at this point, we've always been sovereign! And, and I would point out that the House of Commons itself established in one of the first bills published post the referendum that we have always been sovereign. So that these claims that we weren't sovereign were palpably ridiculous. But sometimes an idea gets so baked into public discourse that trying to get it out would be like trying to get the eggs out of a baked cake. It, there's just no point trying to. So by using the phrase sovereign choice, I see, I see it more as a form of underlining the word choice. If I am the minister for widgets and I recognise the wisdom of telling the market for widgets, telling the international market for widgets, the bulk of which is going to be the geographically closest markets, right? The geographically closest countries or territories. The wisdom of saying our laws or, or our regulatory requirements, our product standards are en enshrined as being identical to yours. It is a sovereign choice. It is, it is the policy of this government. It is the, I don't know if it counts as law, forgive me, I'm not a constitutionalist, but it is the law of this land, either actually or metaphorically, that any widgets manufactured here must be manufactured to precisely the same standards that are dictated by European Union product standards. I mean, why wouldn't you want to, unless you only want to sell your widgets to people up the road or people around the corner, or, or, or you have a case for substandard uh, domestic widgets, which you'd knock out the back of the production line while making the good stuff for the continent out the front. I'm simplifying slightly, but that, I think, is the point of this. Um, uh, it's contained within the Product Safety and Metrology Bill, and uh, not, not everybody has picked up on it. My thanks to Matthew Holhouse of The Economist for bringing it to my attention. Um, and, and this is good. This is not, not um, uh, specifically proposed veterinary alignment on SPS standards. This is specifically on goods, and, and that's the bit that perhaps is, is new. So, 12 minutes after 10 is the time. And, and they can go either way. They can unilaterally decide to diverge as well. So you can, you can mirror or diverge on future EU product standards on, on a product-by-product product basis. Now, I don't think that in the first instance it makes much difference to uh, checks, to, to friction at the borders. But it is a meaningful step towards regulatory alignment, which... I think there's no point establishing regulatory alignment or enshrining regulatory alignment unless the plan is, at some point, to formalise it through membership of a customs union or a single market or, 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 or not, I don't think, don't get your hopes up, not the European Union anytime soon. And what this did to me today is it, it drew, drew my attention in conjunction with the fact that Germany... Uh, France, all, all the European countries, whether they're in the EU or not, they're all arriving in Oxfordshire today for a summit being hosted by uh, Sir Keir Starmer. 
And, and when you see these two stories alongside each other, a question that we haven't actually asked before starts forming in the back of my mind. And questions related to Brexit that we haven't asked before on this programme are as rare as hen's teeth. Some questions related to Brexit we have asked 67 million times together on this programme. But this is a question I wasn't expecting to ask for a while, for a long while yet. And here we are asking it today. And the other element, the other <clears throat> building block in this question is the predictable bleatings of people like Boris Johnson and, and, and Nigel Farage and, and, and Liz Truss, who still try to scaremonger by insisting that Keir Starmer wants to rejoin the European Union or undo Brexit. The, these, these are the kind of rhetorical flourishes that these washed out old dishcloths are still barking into the ether in the hope of um, uh, revivifying the ignorance, confusion and anger of all of the people that they conned in 2016. And it seems to me that it seems to me that the, the failure of these rhetorical flourishes to generate anything like the levels of uh, division and, and fibrility that they would have done even, even a year ago, even two years ago, it says to me two things. It says to me that Keir Starmer has defused much of this discourse. So I'm sure there'll be some weirdo in the Telegraph getting his facts wrong and, and pretending to be very angry or even not pretending to be very angry about this. But, but you know, we can see them as sort of conversational cul-de-sacs now in the context of Brexit. Keir Starmer has successfully defused much of the discourse, which means that they can do things like quietly announce in the King's speech that ministers will be able to unilaterally mirror future EU product standards, which are about to be updated. There's nothing to be gained, really, from diverging from them. But I think it raises the possibility of something else. I think it raises the possibility of something else. Um, I think it's time to talk about the detoxification of the entire discussion. Is it, is, is, is it happening? So I'm not expecting uh, uh, phalanxes of Farragists to start marching through Westminster insisting that, that he apologises or be held responsible for the lies that he told or the nonsenses that, that were spewed by him and his various organisations. I'm not expecting Boris Johnson to reverse ferret on his reverse ferret and return to the political platform he was on when he was a, 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 a fairly enthusiastic uh, European, a fairly enthusiastic advocate of European Union membership. I'm not expecting hard man of Brexit, Steve Baker, to park the fast catamaran and return to the fray with a mea culpa and an apology. I, I, that's, I, I'm not expecting any of that. That's what I mean when I talk about what's the opposite of boiling a frog. And it's not freezing a frog or, or, or unboiling a frog. I'm talking about something I, I hadn't expected. I don't even think I can claim that I expected it at a later date. I hadn't, I've never thought about this before. I haven't contemplated it. But is the poison disappearing? Is, is the toxicity that has typified this conversation, this entire political moment since its inception, that the, the nastiness, the viciousness, the drinking of Remainer tears, the calling all the leavers racists, how, is it now, as early as 2024, is it possible that the poison is diminishing? And the way I want to do this is by talking about you as either someone who recognises that description and realises that you're not, your blood isn't boiling anymore, your, uh, your, 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 your temper isn't rising, your blood pressure isn't pumping, your, your animosity towards French people is in, is in abeyance or, or, or your fear of Polish lorry drive. Just, I can't quite remember what I was so cross about. That might be you. It might be a, just a, a more simple kind of, well, I didn't really think that much about it when I voted but I, but I did and I, and I wish I hadn't but hey ho on we go but what I'm really interested in is whether or not the the toxicity in your personal relationships is diminishing the people 
that you almost couldn't talk to because they were so adamant and, forgive me, ignorant about what leaving the European Union would mean. That that viciousness, the, 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 the toxicity of the relationship, the toxicity of the conversation. Damien wins, by the way, from Watford. The opposite of boiling a frog, James, is restoring it to its natural habitat. Is that, am I going mad? Or is the conversation calming down a lot and the sense that we need to move a, a little bit backwards to start with towards Europe is just taking hold in a really calm and sensible and measured way? Or uh, am, I, am I dreaming? What's going on in your world? What's going on with the people to whom you, you, you couldn't speak for a while or about, about to whom you would never speak about anything else? Is the conversation becoming more civilised, despite the best efforts of the usual suspects to keep pumping the poison into the, into the veins of the population. I, I, I honestly think it is. I honestly think it is. But I'm here to hear from you that it isn't, of course. 0345 973 is the number that you need. The, the, the sort of slow, the gentle deflation of an enormous barrage balloon of bilge is underway. And I think it's important for those of us who um, described in forensic detail the contents of the barrage balloon of bilge, not to be smug or gloaty or, or even celebratory. You just want to return to our natural habitat. Or am I overdosing on hopium for the third time this week? It's 20 minutes after 10. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The number you need is 0345 6060 973. 22 minutes after 10. And, and I suppose the, the, the question also um, becomes, how do we conduct these conversations in a way that, that leaves behind the, the toxicity and divisiveness that, that typified any conversations about European Union membership from... Well, from pretty much 1973 onwards. This is nice from Lorraine. Amelioration is the word that you need. I think you're right. A linguistic term which refers to how negative concepts over a process of time and changed contextual usage evolve into a positive context concept. It's very clever of Starmer to start that process in the text of his King's Speech. Thank you, Lorraine. Are we, are we embarked upon an amelioration? Um, not everywhere. Julie, who's changed her name, uh, says the toxicity is still so bad in my family that it's still a conversation that can't be had, which is significant in itself, because if it was going well, the people that had voted for it would want to talk about it all the time, wouldn't they? I think. Um, phone lines are open. Matthew's in Wigan to kick things off. Matthew, what do you reckon? Um, I, I don't think it's a, a sore subject anymore. Really? Both, both me and my father voted for Brexit, which just not worked. Uh, the, 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 pe the people who are trying to do it were obviously incompetent, and you try to tell us, and I was one of these people that sat here many, many, many an hour shaking and screaming at radio when you was on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for hanging in there, mate. <laughs> no, on. Luke, uh, you, you, you were right at the end. I just wish, I just wish more of us listened to you. I, I do think it's time for a second, an, another referendum, but obviously we can... Oh, that, that's a very, very long in. way off. Did, so if it, what I'm interested in, and you and your dad... Uh, you know, two, two, two anecdotes don't make data, but you probably speak for, for, for others, is that when the, when, the, when, the bush, when the buttons that were pushed in 2016, when the same people pop up and start trying to push them again, when they talk about Keir Starmer wants to undo Brexit or Keir Starmer wants to um, uh, drag us back into the yoke of, of, uh, of Brussels and all, all the rhetoric that, that was a very, very effective and, and it clearly worked on you and your father, those buttons won't work anymore. Is that what you're telling me? Absolutely not. Look, 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 at, look at what's happened. Everything's just got bloody worse, hasn't it? You well, know, yes. no, nothing's, nothing's, nothing works. And it, 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 we were promised all sorts, all that money for NHS. Oh, where's all that gone? You know, no, nobody, nobody ever asks. You know. How, um, how, how much do you think it is a, a, an opportunity missed as opposed to an opportunity that never existed? As in. As if the, the benefits of as, as if as if there is a good Brexit, but it goes to a different school, or there is something that's good, but it, it, it would have needed somebody different to implement it. I'll be honest with you, mate. I don't think it ever existed in the first place. It was all sold a pack of lies, and yeah, yeah. fifty-two percent of the population swallowed it. 
Matthew, beautifully put. Thank you. You will you will not be speaking, obviously, for the entire 52%. And some people, of course, will... Um, I, I think, where's the one that was accusing me of being in a... Uh, in an echo chamber. It was perfectly polite. Patrick, I think you've made yourself a cosy echo chamber. I regularly still speak to people who insist that our Brexit needs to be harder. I, I'm So do I, Patrick. Goodness, p- probably more than anyone. But when you say, what do you mean by harder? They haven't got the first idea. In the same way, they didn't really know what leave meant, which is why they had to campaign on the promise that leave meant leave. Because if you ask them what it actually meant, they couldn't tell you. Or, or, or they'd tell you one thing and then another person who was voting for it would tell you something completely different. So the moment when we should all have clocked, as Matthew um, uh, uh, recognises, the moment we should all have clocked what was on the horizon was the moment when they started campaigning under the slogan, leave means leave. Or they started, was that post-Brexit or before Brexit? That might have been after Brexit. That might have been sort of when Theresa... What do you mean leave? I remember sitting here. You can't say leave means leave. That's like talking to a six-year-old. Peas mean peas. Dinner means dinner. Why do I have to eat my peas? Because I say so. That's not an answer to the question. You, should, you, you, you Leave means leave. What does it mean? And that's the point at which I think I realised that we were embarking on a really, really, really weird period of, uh, of, of political discourse. Do you think that the conversation is calming down? And if it isn't, if you don't think it is, what do you think it would take? To, to, to nudge the discourse in that direction. Uh, Peter's in Gillingham. Peter, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning, James. Hello, I'm Peter. now free to speak to you because I stood a candidate for election before. How did you get um, on? T- so uh, I did better than I should have done. Okay. I, I, beat, I beat two national parties, came six out of eight, um, and it was on an anti-Brexit ticket. But to answer your question... Yes. Uh, I go out daily doing what I call brexorcisms, and I think the intensity of the dialogue is down. Try not to say things like that when I've just taken a sip of tea, will you, Peter? <laughs> Please. Oh, that was almost a very messy moment in the studio. Carry on. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, I think in general I would say that the in- there's two points. The intensity of the conversation is down. People now know that, you know, Two, nearly two thirds of the people think it's a mistake, mm. but the intensity of the conversation I had on the street with the remaining few was more intense. Insofar as I had my car uh, key, that's oh. five hundred quid damage, mm. and I had me bicycle tyres slash because I cycled round. I stood a cat for election here in Gillingham, and it was on an anti-Brexit ticket. And the Reform Party just, were just back up. You stood a cat for ele- a cat, C A T. Yes, you heard that correctly. Okay. What was My that? question was, could a cat do any worse than Rishi Sunak? Most people agreed with that proposition. Mm. Mm. Anyway, um, but the Reform Party sat on the uh, on the hustings with me and said it was because we got the wrong Brexit. So right. all those arguments... And they did quite well. The... Not, not, I mean, they didn't do as well in, in, by some measures as they did in 2015 when they were called something else, but they, but they remain... Um, uh, you know, a, a rump, a 15% rump of the electorate, and they are still uh, yeah. both committed was... to it and still, because I don't think we can malign every reform voter as a potential no. bicycle no. tyre slasher. No, 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 but, but I have good reason to believe but still that vitriolic. one of followers did it. Still vitriolic. Um, um, so I, I universally go into the, you know, the uh, end of the dragon, as it were. I go to places where the, where they are and mm. talk to them endlessly and let them talk themselves down from the mountain. And the arguments they still rehearse is they've they've now been let down, right. not by Nigel but by us. Yes, yes, by it's by a, the people familiar. by the people on the stage, as opposed to the hecklers. Uh, the, the, if only the hecklers had been in charge. Everything would have been absolutely fine. Is, is that is that um, is that the end of your political career or the cat's political career? I don't know who who makes um, that decision. Well, the cat is in charge clearly in yes. real life. Yes. We, you know, we are only slaves to the cat. But no, I considered doing it again. But I did it to do two things: to pull the Tory vote down and switch it to Labour, which of which I still have some problems with around Brexit. But nonetheless, mm. no, didn't too. touch Labour. Yeah. Uh, and I, I succeeded at either moving people away from the Tories, if in some cases to uh, to the Reform Party, actually. Mm. But if they wouldn't go there, the cat would have their vote. And I got quite a lot of votes that I didn't deserve because people who wanted none of the above and wouldn't move to Labour voted for the cat. I like it. Who is Who has the strongest claim to being the Brexit, you or me? Uh, both of us. I sent you my book actually about a year ago. Oh. I don't know if it got through the uh, the turnstile. No, but... I, I don't remember it. Is it called the Brexit? 
No, it's called Reboot Britain. No, you should have called it the Brexit. I, I get three or four a day, so don't take it personally oh, okay. well, that, I, I, that I may not have try, noticed. But I'll if you'd called it the Brexit, I'd have noticed. I'll try again with the uh, the doorman. I look forward sometime. to it. Thank you, Peter. You take care. It is coming out to half past ten. The worst thing that ever happened in the context of people that send me books is when we had a slightly dull caller on the program. I don't know if you were listening that day. And I said, um, I said, I don't want to be rude. I'm just going to move you along. I'll wait for your autobiography to find out more about that part of your story. And he said, well, I, I, I self-published it and sent it to you last year. I didn't really have any comeback from that. Uh, it is just gone half past ten. The question is, is, is the conversation... Um, losing some of its viciousness, losing a lot of its viciousness. And I think one way to focus on this question is when the right-wing newspapers start writing headlines about Keir Starmer surrendering sovereignty or Keir Starmer leading us back or Keir Starmer trying to undo Brexit, if you're someone who would previously have risen to that bait, are you feeling yourself a little more relaxed in response to that kind of rhetoric. And crucially, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the second-hand evidence, the mum, the dad, the uncle, the auntie Doris, who would once have been uh, swallowing it all, uh, hoovering up this kind of rhetoric and, and, and largely unevidenced uh, vitriol. Has everybody calmed down a bit now in your world? 0345 6060 973. And if you hit the numbers now, you will get through. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. 10.34 is the time. I wish you were right, James, says Deborah in Kent. I've had a couple of texts from Kent, actually, making this point in, in different ways, different but similar. I wish you were right, James, but in my friendship group, the conversation is still very difficult, and so we don't go there at all, I'm afraid. Um, whereas Don says, the poison has been cut out of the body, the medics are healing the body, although the poison is still in the air, you can still smell it, which means the vitriol is still around, but it's possibly not swilling around the Brexit conversation as uh, as much as it used to do. Um, Toby and Peter up next. Before that, a little masterclass in journalism for, for, for me, actually, <laughs> and, and, and for you, if you're interested, from Emily Maitlis, who's at that Republican convention in America. And th I, this interview is so important to all of the conversations that we have together on the programme about fake news and about... Um, the, the detachment from reality and the, the collapse in norms, if you like, that's happened on both sides of the Atlantic, but still, for now, happily, uh, uh, much more violently on the other side. So she sat down with Carrie Lake, who is a, a former television anchor who, who ran for a governorship in America on Donald Trump's ticket, and crucially, after losing, embarked upon an extraordinary round of, of lying and libeling former opponents and anybody pointing out that Joe Biden had actually won the election. And the challenge of how you interview somebody who is so so blatantly dishonest and yet so outwardly plausible. You know, she still looks like a television anchor. She, she's uh, like, almost like alternative facts in human form. How does a journalist get under the, the bonnet of the... I wish I could use a word beginning with B that's often used to describe lies because the bonnet of the B word would sound absolutely brilliant, wouldn't it? But how does a journalist get under the bonnet of this blatant detachment from reality? I have never heard anybody do it as well as Emily Maitlis on the News Agents podcast did it to Carrie Lake yesterday. Just have a listen to this. And, and if, you're, if you're listening to the show while painting a fence or... or, or um, fixing your lawnmower or whatever it may be. Just just concentrate a little more than perhaps you, you, you have been doing previously because this is, this is brilliant. Donald Trump has talked, Mr. Trump's talked about the need for a new tone in politics, a civility in politics, a kind of unity. What does that mean to you? I, I actually think the tone has always been good. I, I believe that what we're trying to push is a strong economy, secure borders. These are policies everybody wants. And so you don't the think the tone in think, American politics I think got out of tone, hand? I think the tone is really disturbing when the media is calling a man like Donald Trump Hitler. They're comparing him to Hitler. Like J.D. Vance, do you mean? The, 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 like the media is doing. But J.D. Vance was probably, it, like many Americans, they listen to the media. And for eight years, the media has been tearing President Trump apart. A good man who everybody loved before he ran. Imagine having a smear campaign going on about you for eight years. Yeah. Pretty soon, everyone wouldn't like you. And, and so I applaud the fact that people like J.D. Vance and others, we've seen them, Amber Rose, 
She did a speech. People are coming over going, whoa, the media was lying and I believed it. And it's so irresponsible. And you falsely claimed that Trump won in 2020. You called for the imprisonment of those who accepted Trump's defeat, including your own opponent in Arizona, Katie Hobbs. Why did you do that? Called for the imprisonment of what? Of opponents like Katie Hobbs who accepted Trump's defeat. Why did you falsely claim that Trump won in 2020? Well, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and go through all of the evidence of what happened. Do you believe Joe Biden won 81 million votes? Do you think he's more popular? A guy who can't string two sentences together. You believe he's more popular than Barack Obama? I'm asking you, do you believe that he is the most popular president in the history? You have to have have, you got to have brain cells. In okay, this. so you don't believe that Joe Biden won the election in 2020? I believe the election was run fraudulently. And you refused to concede in 2022 as well, your own contest. Well, you obviously, obviously you're lawsuits. sitting across the pond and you don't understand what's happened. And I'm not going to argue you about it with somebody. for defamation. Yeah, because this is how corrupt the system is. I, I pointed out how they worked our elections. You lied about a top Arizona election official. You defamed him. You falsely accused him of injecting 30,000 illegal votes into machines, intentionally misprinting yep. ballots. Yep. Do you it stand happened. by those yes, claims? it happened. Would you like to repeat them on air now? It happened. You no, think I, you know what? that he intentionally misprinted ballots? If you he would, sued you for this. Yes, I know. I'm in the middle of it right now. It's lawfare. And he and said guess what? that guess you what? had turned his life upside down. He said you'd made him the Listen, target of threats of Emily, violence and Emily, death. I'm in the middle of a lawsuit and I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to uh, work. When you're in the middle of a lawsuit, you don't want to talk about it. Okay. We talk about it in court. That's where we talk about it. I feel confident that I've spoken the truth. But you know what? You I'm made him the target of violence and death. You saw what happened on the stage on Saturday night. You heard Donald Trump say, let's lower the temperature. Do you accept the part you played in inflaming the political never, rhetoric no. in this country? You are just part of the fake news and you're lying. You don't know a damn thing about Arizona. You don't know one thing about our election. And you sit there with a smirk on your face. You're sitting over in England, in, in, in the UK, in a country that's being destroyed. In a country that's being destroyed. I guess I'm just asking and I really don't, what it says uh, about you know, the Republican this is the last Party. Question. That they this need is to the, lie, to intimidate, question. to threaten, because you don't believe you can win at the ballot box. Why would you need to do that? You are just a sad case of a human being, and I'm so sorry for you. I'm sorry that you bought into the propaganda. I hope that you'll look in the mirror and see that you've been, you've been following propaganda and you don't understand what's happening. So I'm guessing if you don't win in November, you won't concede. That's the rule that you're playing by now, is it? You are, I, I actually think you need your head examined. Can you answer that? I think you need your head examined. Carrie Lake, thank you very much. <laughs> Emily Maylis there, I, conducting one of the finest interviews I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. Um, was that a little electric guitar kicking in at the end then? It was the Star Spangled Banner of the, the American news agents. Brilliant stuff. Um, I uh, I wanted to play you that for two reasons. The first is it really plays into the J.D. Vance conversation that we were having yesterday. Whereas we used to think these people were uh, snake oil salesmen who knew that what they were selling was snake oil. I, I, I think an awful lot of them now are as infected as the people in the crowds with bandages on their ears as a sort of form of cultish homage to, to Donald Trump. It, the mistake of thinking that the leaders are cynically shepherding the herd into the space of alternative facts and fake news, that, that era is over. The leaders are absolutely as high on the on the lie as the followers are. And that, that is the best proof of that that I've ever seen. Absolutely fantastic interview there because I, I, one of the best things that happened to me in therapy was I became capable of admitting when people are better at stuff than I am. Well, ever since school, I, 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 you've seen it a lot among public, well, among men in particular, but public school boys in, 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 in general, incapable of admitting that someone else is better than you are at anything. You know, you, you can find people who sort of think that they're better at cricket than Brian Lara if they just got the right wind behind them on the right day. What Emily did there that I could never do in a million years is, is not just stay calm, but zone in. So start saying you've, you need your head examining. Start trying to... They tried to change the course of the conversation. She tried... And, and the more desperate she got, 
the harder she tried to change the course of the conversation. You should look in the mirror. You need your head examined. Your country is falling. And she didn't go for any of that. She didn't go for any of it. I'd have gone, well, how? How is our country falling apart? And, and then that little moment, that little spot that she was zoning in on would, would have disappeared. But that's, that's laser-like. That's called focus, that is. And it's an it's a, it's a absolute joy to witness. Back to Britain, back to Brexit, back to our equivalent, if you like, of all the, um, uh, the, the lies and fake news and alternative facts. Is there a sense abroad that the toxicity of the conversation is, is diminishing, that, that things are calming down a lot? And if there is, what does that mean? And of course, if there isn't, Where's the vitriol going? Toby's in Bristol. Toby, what would you like to say? Hello, my um, MP until very recently was Diane Debonair, yes. and she was door knocking just before the election, before Carla won her seat. And I uh, had a very interesting conversation with her about Brexit, and uh, and she said it's a bit like um, when you've had a really messy divorce, you don't hop straight back into bed with your ex-partner. Yeah. What you do is you take them out for coffee. And you have a nice conversation. And that's what's happening at Blenheim feels- Palace at the moment, I think. Exactly. Mm. And I, th- and I, th- I found that to be a really reassuring. I'm a, I'm, pa- I'm a very passionate Remain. I- I'd be back in today if we could, but I know that's not a realistic situation. Precisely. But I was, I was reassured by the sounds they were making. And I thought that the fact that, I think you, you said it earlier on, the detox, him, Sama being beginning to detoxify the whole issue. And it's the, it's the thought, it's hopefully the question that might come back in if they get a second term. Yeah, that, well, you've preempted my next question. So, when when would the headlines reporting a, a, a serious reversal of national policy fail to sting? Because I think they'd still sting a bit. The size of the majority means they could probably do it a little bit sooner than we elected, than we uh, expected. But it's an it's it's a shallow majority. It's huge, but but thinly spread, yeah. as it were. So, you think second term before they before they move? I, I into think so. I, I, I think it's. Yes, as one of your previous callers said, it's, it's, I think the, mess- the text message you read out, it, it, the smell is still hanging in the air. And it, it doesn't take much to get people to jump back into their respective corners if you bring yeah. the subject up. There you go. And, so that, that's um, the first uh, little sprinkle of cold water upon my hopium-induced euphoria. Yes, and, and I found the metaphor um, about the boy and the frog might be stroking a tiger. It's done very cautiously and very gently. Yeah, I still bite your arm off, though. I, and that, of course, is your point. Toby, thank you. Uh, it's 10.45. A lot of you are asking to hear Emily Maylis' interview with Nigel Farage as well in Milwaukee. I'm more than happy to, to have a small section of the programme devoted to the Emily Maitlis, uh Appreciation Society, but um, we'll see whether or not we've got time to um, to share that to, to share that as well. Uh, 10.45 is the time. Phone lines are open. Conversation continues after this. 10.47 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I think the conversation has calmed down. I think it's because Brexit wasn't mentioned in the election campaigns, really. Um, that was a win, I think, for Starmer, because it deprived... I kept talking to you about him taking weapons out of his opponent's hands and sort of wrapping them in cotton wool and giving them back. And the newspapers, more so than the, uh, than the Conservatives, the newspapers w- were given nothing for him to uh, to bite, uh, nothing to, to attack him with because he just kept closing the conversation down. So the more they shouted, he wants to reverse Brexit. And he just said, well, no, I don't. I, to the point of, of explicitly stating we won't be returning to the single market, the customs union or the European Union, which, of course, means that if the toxicity is being turned down, it isn't necessarily for reasons that Remainers or whatever we call them now, rejoiners, would... Um, would be celebrating um that that was from dan that message and he he continues i think because it's treated as a black and white argument it automatically creates division when it's not talked about leavers lose their ammunition so they will try to drag other issues up um where am i going next alan or peter alan is in manchester alan what would you like to say morning james hello mate yeah um well i'm i think there is the toxicity is dying down because of i think people's experience that the country is poorer, and if you do go abroad, you have to spend half an hour in a queue having your passport stamped where the rest of the EU is walking past. Do you know what counts as uh, good news now? What's that, James? There's, there's a story today about the, the next round of checks is going to be delayed a bit, which is fantastic news for us, and, and uh, a decision taken entirely by the EU. 
So, you know, taking back control means we're now celebrating them saying, do you know what, we'll give you a few months on the, uh, on the old system, which is worse than the system before, but then we will be moving on to the new system, which will make those delays. Yeah. At least in the first yeah. instance, we'll have to hope things evolve, but in the first instance, those delays will be even longer. Yeah, but I mean, what I wanted, I mean, what I was trying to say, and I think the last clip with Emily Maitlis summed it up brilliantly. Good. Is where has, where is the big... T- expose on TV yeah. about Brexit, the, you know, the, the disaster of it. We've, on, on one hand, we've got the, you know, the, the, the rabid right-wing press. But, what, what, you know, the BBC now is cowering. The, the, the good journalists, Emily, John Sopel, Mark Urban, uh, they've all left. We left Lewis, left, Goodall, left, Lewis Goodall. Lewis Goodall, yeah. All the brilliant journalists have, in the BBC have left. We've just left... There's like, still, still some brilliant ones there. I, I can't let that pass un, unnoticed. We've got Michelle Hussain, well, well, we've got well, Victoria Derbyshire, we've got some brilliant journalists doing brilliant work over at the right, BBC. But James, James Newsnight has been reduced now to an half an hour chat show. Where's, and, the, and, where's the serious journalism? Where's the world in actions? Where's the panoramas? Where, on this issue, that's what we need. On, on this issue, so somebody on actually. Issue, yeah. Well, that's not going to exactly. happen, is it? That, I'm so glad you came on after that comment about wrapping weapons in cotton wool and giving them back to the enemy, because you, you're describing the the downside of the detoxification is that Starmer's not going to go there. So why would anybody else? But yeah, but sooner or later, James. I mean, no, the, the country. Andrew Marr. Well, I've. I've, I've, I've I have, I have differences with... with I, I well, I don't, I'm not, I'm not that opening that. up a critique of my colleagues. I thought we were just doing a lovely <laughs> list of the brilliant ones, or, or some of the brilliant ones that used to be at the BBC. Well, Sheila well, Fogarty, the, well, the thing all is, James, day. It, yes. James, you, you are the hero Stop of it. many of us. Brexicist you know, is my new name. I'm the Brexicist, yeah, Alan. That's the Brexicist. Name. That's my new title. You are the Brexicist, <laughs> and, you, and you, are the, you are giving us the oxygen we need to survive. Yeah, but I've not done ways. it. I've not done the things you describe. I've stayed well clear of it for a while. We just have days like today, we dip back into it. It's not b- between you and me. It's not been the most popular response on the switchboard of the week. I, I mean, I normally would expect to have every single I'm phone on, line. But Because we, you <laughs> got through, so you know how low the bar is today. Yeah, but yeah. but that idea of the, 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 the job of the journalist is to give the people what they need to arrive at informed conclusions, that is probably still some way over the horizon. And that is precisely why I played that, that Emily Maitlis clip, just to, to, to remind us all how you address politicians who are, are still dancing around. Uh, well, can we call them liars? Yeah, of course you can, but they're still dancing yeah. around like serious operators, and we've got our fair share here, but, but how do you interview them in the same way that you interview people who aren't liars in a way that gets to the heart of the dishonesty and the deception at the, at the very sort of core of them? And when you do, they start accusing you of all sorts of things. I think Nigel Farage accused Emily of not having any friends during an interview that, that, that she did with her a little later in the day. And I, a number of people who have just texted me the words Eddie Mayer in uh, uppercase, in capital letters, is, is testament, of course, as well, to yet more evidence of the talent hemorrhage that the BBC endured, largely as a consequence of putting someone called Robbie Gibb in a position of seniority, a man who was knighted by Theresa May shortly after stepping down as her director of communications and arrived at the BBC to lecture people like Lewis Goodall on impartiality and objectivity. It was also him that sent out an instruction that everyone should stop talking about Brexit, i.e. not go near what Alan describes, which you would um, loosely typify as as detailed and evidence-based descriptions of what is actually happening, what the actual consequences are. But probably the most shameful day in the context of BBC editorial policy that anybody would be permitted or, or, or allowed to kind of insist on a form of omerta or a form of silence about the consequences of something so consequential. Um, some journalists, of course, re- resisted and refused. But what Alan says when he talks about that, uses that word cowed, that is precisely what he is describing. 10.53 is the time. Thank you, Alan. Peter's in the New Forest. Peter, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, mate. Um, I think what we really need is something like um, what happens in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm. in which all sides admit to their errors their lies and their misjudgments and you very um, astutely as you always did pointed out what the um, Brexiteers got wrong but yes. you, you you don't say what the Remainers got wrong you've consistently said it was going to be a disaster but it hasn't been a disaster, there has been no Brexit disasters, there's been pinch points, there's been difficulties 
But using language well, four, like four percent, four percent of GDP for the foreseeable future is a disaster. That was that was a projection. Let no, me that's tell Goldman you, Sachs, mate. That, that's the projection yeah, that's that Rishi Sunak Sachs used to use to, to to be a that's hedge fund. A to that's be a hedge a fund manager. That's a projection, and it hasn't happened. It, well, it has Goldman happened. Sachs, and, uh, but, no, it hasn't. Goldman well, Sachs have, 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 consist, have been pulled up for, for wrong predictions in the past. Can I just give you some of the untruths that um, were predicted by the remate? But by the remate. Are you here to okay. are, are you here to no, demonstrate no, no. that the toxicity hasn't gone away, and that, that pe- trying, pe- people like you, despite that... winning, are still bitter about things that were said by the other side no, ten, I'm, ten I'm years ago? I'm not bitter at all. I'm trying to explain why I think the toxicity has gone because people like yourself <laughs> realised you got it wrong, and therefore <laughs> you're therefore you're you know it's no good giggling. I can't you help make... giggling. Giggling's oh, allowed. Right, well, Come right. on, giggling's allowed. Right. If people say funny okay. things, we're allowed to giggle. All right, you are. Well, so what did I get wrong? Funny, let me tell, tell me tell you some funny things that were said. No, by tell the me what I got wrong. Things. Yeah, well, you, I think you 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 well, you can either agree with these. I think you agreed with all of these. I don't listen. No, to tell me what I got wrong. George Osborne said house prices would fall. Tell by me 18. what I got wrong. I think you repeated that at the time. <laughs> I, I, I can assure you that I didn't. I was working for the BBC at the time, so I was scrupulously impartial. But what, what did I get wrong, personally? I'm talking... No, don't... You always do this. You do, I'm talking about you the You literally Remainer, just said you, th- you yeah. realise you've got everything wrong and that's why the toxicity is diminishing. I'm perfectly right, I'm entitled to respond I'm by saying, what, what did I get wrong, Peter? about the Remainers. What, You're trying what did I get wrong? Talking. Well, I'll tell you two huge mistakes you, you made on your show. You said that the four freedoms were indivisible and that we would not get tariff-free trade. No, and frictionless got, trade. No, you said tariff-free trade. Frictionless trade, time. Peter. No, you were wrong. You said tariff-free trade. And I've asked your producer to go back because you didn't expect... Frictionless, you know, frictionless you trade. Know, and and there, are tariffs. Said, there are tariffs. There are tariffs in space, in place. We large it's on services. It's largely tariff. Try, try and import a, try and import a crate of tomatoes from say, France, you, you Peter. What, what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to channel Emily Maitlis. I'm going to channel Emily Maitlis, and I'm going to say, are there tariffs or are there costs attached to well, importing can things? You, can you, can Peter, you, you must let me. You must let me speak. No, no you must let you, me. I'm not allowed to giggle, and now I'm not allowed to speak. So the question no, is very no, simple. You're, you're not qu- allowing P- me to speak. Peter, I, I have to ask you a question no, before you can answer it. No, you said we, we've got a degree. Does it cost more to trade. import and goods? You said, you said Peter, we would get the, you can keep talking we, over me, but everyone can hear that you're not answering the question. Okay. Yeah, you're not answering my question because you haven't allowed me. Nine point six Just billion pounds I'll worth. Your question. Okay. Just let me tell you some of the lies that the Remainers said. Right? No, because that's but not what the phone in is. The phone in's not that. I want you to answer the question of whether or not. Yeah, it and na- I've the... answered it, and now I'm going to go. What was, what was your it. answer? My answer was: you said that there would that the four freedoms were indivisible. Which is true. We, we would not that, that's, in the, that's in the Charter of the European we, we Union, Peter. We would not Peter. get any tariff... Friction, any, frictionless uh, trade. Any tariff-free trade. Frictionless so trade. So now the question then becomes, you are there now... Peter, mate, I thought you were here to tell me the toxicity had diminished. Yeah, I have. And you're sounding you well now, toxic, mate. Because you won't allow me to get to... No, to, I won't to, allow you to avoid the question. I won't allow you to avoid the question. No, you won't allow me to speak. You do this all the time. I, no, I don't. I insist that right. people answer the question. Are you George going to answer Osborne the question? Are you going to Are you going to answer the question? The CBI. I've answered the question, and now I'm asking you to move on. The CBI, sponsored by Price Waterhouse, and you repeated this after it said that unemployment would. Be- I think we can all agree I'm never going to be Emily Maitlis, am I? I think you just you just have to take your wins where you find them and accept your limitations when you stumble across them. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The time is approaching 10.59. Um, it's Thursday. Mystery hours on the way. Big news breaking at 12, potentially, although it's unlikely to be quite the... Um, uh, uh, epic intervention that many of us would be hoping for, but the, the results of the COVID inquiry begin to be released to the public, and uh, they'll begin with the question of preparation, how prepared the country was. But up next, there's a really weird story, well, not weird, but a very poignant story on the front of the Times newspaper this morning. 
where it is reported that women are leaving it later than ever. I don't know why it says women. I suppose because it's women that give birth. But, but people are leaving it later than ever to become parents. So it looks particularly at this through the lens of IVF treatment. And it raises the possibility, the increased possibility, of realising at some point in your 30s or 40s that you're never going to have the children you'd always thought you would. Three minutes after 11, a complete change of mood now and a, and a complete change of subject. This is a story that there was a time in my life I didn't think I'd ever be able to talk about. And the, the fact that I can means that I not only had a happy conclusion to my experiences, but, but also have an inkling of what it would be like to have an unhappy one. The Times reports that women are waiting too long to have babies, and I, I, I've picked up on the use of the word women in that first line because uh, most women don't have babies on their own, um, and of course, uh, scientifically, they can't. But the age of the woman is the point of the story here, so I, I don't think it's a, 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 a semantic hair-splitting exercise. I think it's the correct way to phrase it. Um, w women are waiting too long to have babies. The average age of those starting IVF treatment has now passed 35 for the very first time. I don't know if you've noticed that I, I'm, I'm suffering at the moment from a, 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 an inability to avoid knitting stories together uh, because I see this story alongside the fact that figures published this week reveal that the birth rate in this country is the lowest it has been since 2002 and another piece of research uh, published today showing that um, it's projected that we will need, and obviously, as Peter just reminded us, uh, yeah, you don't want to pay any attention to projections, uh, it's projected that we'll need about half a million care workers over the next 15 years in order to fix the looming demographic crisis in our, in our care sector. So what you, what you have there is a, a kind of uh, demographic time bomb ticking away in the background. But what we focus on today is is the story in the foreground about the fertility regulator uh, revealing the delays that are rendering many women unable of being mothers. Uh, if you leave it too late, you can jeopardize your chance of success. That is in quite cold language. That is the, the, the report from the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority today. Um, it's, it's got a hit rate, a success rate of about 42% for women aged 18 to 34 IVF. That's that results in pregnancy. I, I don't know whether that is the figure for uh, um, the procedures that result in a child, that result in a baby. Uh, but 42% success rate for women aged 18 to 34. And then it falls away quite quickly. So it, it, in your late 30s, the success rate becomes 26%. And once you're in your 40s, the success rate then is closer to 5%. Um, the thing is, and, and I'm going to take a bit of an idiot's guide to this, and, because I will be the idiot, so uh, uh, some of the questions that may be popping up in the minds of people who've been lucky enough not to have any personal experience of this world w would include the, the, the questions about age and the questions about waiting and delay. So the thing is, you, you, you might try via the normal fashion to have a baby for quite a long time. You know, you, 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 you don't go to the IVF clinic after the first menstrual cycle. Um, after you've decided that you're going to try to have a baby, after you decide to stop using contraception. You, you, particularly if you're anything like me and you prefer to stick your head in the sand when there are potential problems on the horizon, you just insist that it's, it's, it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Any minute now, it's going to happen. So you could, that could stretch, depending on how old you are. That could stretch into a, into a two, three, four-year period where once a month there's a sort of frisson of hope and then a, a, a real collapse uh, an emotional collapse that gets bigger with every passing month, every time your partner's period starts. God, I could struggle to remember that, but but the heartbreak of thinking it's two, three days late, and 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 it's going to happen. It's going, and then of course, then of course it doesn't. So there's delay at every turn on this journey. There's pause and delay at every turn, and the later you start the journey, the more profound the impact 
of each and every delay. Dan is being a bit mischievous this morning. He says, what's the normal route, James? Could you please explain in detail? I said, Dan, I, I ask your dad. So every delay magnifies in significance according to the point in your life at which you start the journey. And that means, of course, that difficulty accessing IVF, the likelihoods of the NHS paying for it are diminishing. You've got the pandemic lockdown, which meant people perhaps had a two-year gap in the partner finding process. You've got NHS being under enormous stress. There's so many factors contributing to the uh, increase in delay, to, to the length of the pause, that Frankly, I, I, the more I read this story this morning and the more I thought about it, the, the less surprised I was. So I want to leave the political anxieties aside, although don't be surprised if conversations about tax breaks and to promote marriage and, and childcare. We li live in a country where simultaneously you have people insisting that we don't need immigration and that we don't need to help people have children, um, which is a, a recipe for uh, looming or indeed imminent disaster. So I just want to talk about what it's like to realize. I, I have moments, I can't remember how much of it I've shared with you before, but I have moments in my own memory that uh, I, I, I kind of have them f buried quite deeply in my consciousness. You know, you know, I was adopted, right, because of my dad's issues with fertility. I remember when I, I, it was time to tell dad that we were starting an IVF cycle. And I don't know where this idea came from. He's sitting in a pub garden. And I, and I just said, I think we might be the first ever inherited case of male infertility. Because um, we're not going to be able to do it naturally either. My wife and I. And I, I, I me and my dad had that kind of relationship. We sort of managed to find something almost funny. In the, in the midst of tragedy. But the big difference between 1972 and 2010 or whenever it was, no, 2000 and, and four, two, two, anyway, 20 years ago, 2004, the big difference, <laughs> that's math says, the big difference there with regard to adoption was the relative ease, particularly if you were a Catholic, the relative ease with which you could be matched with, a, with an almost newborn baby in my case, 28 days old. So in the back of my mind, there'd never been any stigma attached to adoption. I was surprised to find the strength of the biological impulse to be a dad because I'd spent, to be a biological parent, because I'd spent my entire life absolutely adamant that it made no difference whatsoever. And, and I, I've got cognitive dissonance here. I absolutely know that I would love my children just as much as I do now if they were adopted and that my parents would love me just as much as they do and did if, if we had not been adopted. It is uh, an amazing thing to, um, to, to reflect upon that even with that background and that knowledge, we have a, a kind of impulse within us. And of course we do. That's evolution. That's what the survival of the species depends upon, that, 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 that impulse to procreate. Not everybody has it, but um, I think most of us do. And so we, we, we did it and... Um, and, and happily it worked, but the, the contemplation, so the other moment, so there's that with dad in the pub garden, and then there's, my wife was away on a job uh, as a journalist, and she was queuing up for chips, I've told you this before, and this was when we're, we're, we're in a state of complete despair, we, you know, we found out it's not going to work, um, and, and there's a, a, a child misbehaving in the fish and chip shop, and the mum is queuing up for chips as well. And, and she, she's turning the kid off. And she says in public loudly, she shouts, it's, she, she shouts, I wish we'd had you, I wish I'd had you aborted. And that would, that, would, that would probably stop you in your tracks at the best of times, right? But if you're contemplating a childless future, and I mean childless, not child free. If you want children and you haven't got them, that's childless. If you don't want them, that's great. That's child free. An important, I think, distinction. And you can imagine the 
impact that had on my wife when, when, when she, we're thinking we're never going to be able to have children and adoption's almost impossible and the IVF success rate is, is even for us as a young couple it's less than half and the state of my sperm was absolutely tr atrocious hardly any of them they were all doing the backstroke was the way that I chose in my blokey way to describe it and and that was the time we looked over the precipice, you know, not knowing whether it would work or not. If you think, if you're trying to do it naturally, and you think that that monthly moment when the period starts is tough, I, I, I can tell you that if you, when you start an IVF cycle and you're, you're on the same tenterhooks, the, those tenterhooks are 10, 20, 30, 40 times bigger than uh, the tenterhooks you have when you're trying to do it naturally because you've got the financial which is uh, close to unaffordable, I'd have thought, for many people. Uh, if you're not lucky enough to get an NHS cycle, and the older you are, the less likely you are to get an NHS cycle. And that means that the, the, the big, for me at least, because of my life experience, the big consequence of this story for me is that it increases the likelihood of women and men, uh, of course, because... Most of these women will be in partnerships with men, not all, but it increase, it massively increases the likelihood of adults who'd always presumed they'd be parents running up quite violently against the realisation that they won't. Now, I've nibbled at the edges of that moment, but it did not come to pass. And I, I'd like today to, I'd like to wonder what it's like and hopefully have some upbeat descriptions of, 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 of uh, uh, moving on, getting over it, realizing that despite what you thought at the time, it wasn't actually the be all and end all of your experience. But also, of course, sharing the, the pain of the moment, the pain of the realization. So, because women are waiting too long to have babies, they jeopardize their chances of success. And when you realize that has happened to you, I can't quite imagine what it's like. So I would ask you to tell me. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Um, in, in a way... I suppose this conversation could act as a, as a catalyst for people who've recognized themselves as being in the foothills of what we're describing in the early days of delay, thinking, well, it hasn't happened yet, but we'll give it another six months before we, before we go to the IVF, or wh whatever it may be, the conversation could act as a catalyst for people at least trying to uh, uh, move things on, along a little more quickly. But, but otherwise, I am, just, I am just fascinated by it. I really am. And I think, I think I can say with some confidence that y y you know that you will receive a sy very sympathetic, empathetic ear. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to ask. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. What is it like to realize that delaying things, pausing things, waiting, that's a nice word. What is it like to realize that waiting too long has jeopardized, has meant that you'll never be the parent you always thought you'd be. 11.16 is the time. The number you need, as ever, is 0345 6060 973. It's 17 minutes after 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It's always... I, did you know, there's a, an article I wrote for the Daily Mail about 18 years ago. Yeah, I know. I know the Daily Mail. I also used to do video game reviews for them, but it was a it was a it was a measurably different newspaper then. But it was still the kind of Daily Mail, in in embryo. Um, that's an un, un, uh, appropriate pun. It was still the the, the the Daily Mail in many ways that that we know today. But it was different enough for me to write for them. And I wrote about fertility treatment by then successful fertility treatment from the perspective of the man because it was a point that was never really explored or examined. And and it's perfectly correct and right that, that this conversation is usually conducted with much more weight on the women and it will be today i'm just talking about the the fact that i still get messages uh from from people saying thank you for that article 
I'm much easier to find, I suppose, than I was 18 years ago on social media and stuff like that. But if you, if you go online looking for stuff, so I say I still get, I don't think I've had anything for about a year, but it was 18 years ago. And if you go online as a man looking for stuff about what your experiences are likely to be, it's still fairly slim pickings. And, and up pops a sort of fresh-faced me uh, photographed in our sitting room with our, with our new baby. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. Um, so what, what is it like to arrive at the opposite destination? Maya's in Waterloo. Maya, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Um, uh, forgive me, this is... Um, yeah, I'm basically in that moment right now. Hmm. Um, and so when I heard you talk this morning, I was like, oh, wow, that's like world colliding. Gosh. Um, sorry. Do I, say, I think I should uh, probably say sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's good. I've not really spoken about it okay. kind of to many friends or anything. But I think there's a couple of things that have kind of led me to where I am, yeah. which I think are important. Um, one is, you know, I am in my early 40s. I'm approaching 43. I'm still single. Uh, not for having tried so hard to look for the right partner. Um, but obviously those are contributing factors. Yeah. Um, and I think on top of that, I lived in, in, in Hong Kong for a very long time, up until 2022. And um, in Hong Kong, you can't get fertility treatment if you are single Good and Lord. not married. Really? Yeah, yeah. It really shocked me as well. So, you were, so you, were, you were already looking into it? at that point yeah I, I mean i thought you know i'll get my eggs frozen yeah. and you know just all those things and then of course the pandemic hit and it hit earlier in asia and it lasted longer right and that's been a massive kind of it's it's just delayed me i mean i you know growing up i think i thought i've always wanted to be a mum. i have that natural instinct you mm. know i mm. you know i just i've always loved children i've always wanted to have my own um and presumed that you would. Yeah, of totally, you know, um, I think, yeah. you know, you get to like your mid-30s and you're still single and you're like, it's okay, you know, I've got until 38, 39 and, and you're still single and you haven't found that right partner. Um, and then a pandemic hits and it just... Sticks everything in, in the in the spin dryer, doesn't it? And, and, oh, a hundred percent. Did you know that at the time? Were you, were you were you were you conscious at the time that you were right in the in the zone, as it were, of being most profoundly affected by this? And at the time, we didn't know how long the pause would be. Yeah, I mean, my my initial thing was in twenty twenty when it was when the pandemic hit. I was my original plan before the pandemic hit was I'll go to Thailand, I'll get fertility treatment there, it's close by. Um, I did not, I think it's really dawned on me in the last couple of years how much the pandemic has taken away from me yeah. as, as a, you know, a woman, not not just in in my personal life, but for her, you know, across many of our lives, you know, mm. across many of the, the spectrum of of what we live in. But I think additional to that, I have a problem with a, a, a post-surgical hernia which is in my abdomen and god the planets really have told, a line for you haven't they oh yeah <laughs> they love me don't they um and what that meant is my surgeon has told me is that the mesh that they would put in would be non-flexible so his parting words to me were and he's a great surgeon sure. and we have a great relationship but he was like you know if you, your baby won't be able to grow inside of you good lord if you you know so i think i'm i'm practicing radical acceptance of course i know i can adopt there's other things well i mean I, 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 not sort of i mean you can but it's it's it's, it's yeah. still very difficult it's, of course it's, it's very difficult yeah. i'm still you know by myself yeah. i don't want to have a baby by myself because right. i I lost a parent. I, you know, I know what it's like to lose a parent. Yeah. I don't want to put my child in a position where they're by themselves. I don't have family around that could help me raise that child should something happen to me. Of course. So right now, so when you spoke this morning... I was speaking like, directly oh to you, God. wasn't I? Yeah. When <laughs> yeah. did you open the box, as it were? When did you start to think we talk about radical acceptance it's not a phrase i've heard before but but it's it's yeah. it's it's it's, it's w when did you start thinking in terms of getting closer to certainty on the issue rather than optimism or, or... i think it's been the last few weeks wow 
And, you know, I, it's summer, I'm in London, you see kids everywhere, and oh, it's like... I forgot about that, my The it, push chairs, you know, man, I couldn't, I couldn't bear the push chairs. Yeah, you see, and I'm always there to help, you know, I engage with kids on the tube, on the train, it doesn't matter, uh, my, you know, friends, mm. kids. But then you look at, you know, I see the relationship between a child and their grandmother, mm. and the child and their you know, their mum when they're older. You know, I see a, that spectrum of relationships that I might not be able to have. And, and you know, because, I, you're in, I, because you're in the middle of it, you don't yet have yeah. the reassurance of, 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 of knowing that you can still feel joy in other ways. Well, you probably know it subconsciously, yeah. or, 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 but, the, you know, that, that because it becomes quite an encompassing yeah. psychological condition, psychological and emotional condition, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think I've I've done well in like I've surrounded by, set myself with friends, close friends who are across the ages, across different family situations, you know. And that's been a very deliberate thing, I think, yeah. for me, just to just to understand that it's not just two point four children. As I, know, I, and increasingly, I, I mean, I'm just going to be much comfort to you at this point, mm-hmm. but, but but it is mm-hmm. increasingly a world in which the 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 the, the, the nuclear two point four is not the. Um, the beginning, the middle, and the end of, of of what adulthood involves, or what family means. But um, but a lot of love coming in for you, Maya. This caller is so unbelievably brave. I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes. She sounds like she has so much love to give. The world isn't fair. It's not, is it? It it it, it really isn't. Um, but but a lot of people wishing you well. I can promise you that. Uh, Mary knows what we are talking about. She says, I'd love to call you, but even after 30 years, I would struggle to talk about our unsuccessful three rounds of IVF without tears. It was the most awful time for me and my lovely partner. Um, and, and this is a happy ending. We went on to adopt two children who were aged five and six then and are now 30 and 31. And they've, um, they've brought us great joy and we love them intensely. But I've never truly recovered from the grief and loss I experienced at that time. An unexpected joy was being present at the birth of my granddaughter, now four, and the sheer delight of watching and being a big part of her early years. 25 after 11. Ben is in Manchester. Ben, what would you like to say? Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, well, it's ironic, actually, because I've always wanted to ring in about the political, uh, political side of things <laughs> that you talk about, but this has been what's made, sort of compelled me to ring in. I wanted to talk about, just you said about the process or, or the time scale of leaving it too long. Um, And in my uh, experience, me and my partner's experience, we um, were a long while before we got the sort of diagnosis of probably not being able to conceive naturally. Because unless it's... if With us, it was a a lot of factors that came together that meant we probably wouldn't conceive. It was not one thing. Right. So with the NHS, we were so long before we actually then were referred. And of course, because of that, you've, you've... less likely to conceive it anyway because you're that bit older. I don't like the ticking clock analogy, but it, I'm afraid it's the only one that really works, isn't it? Yeah, basically, yeah. And I, But I also don't... I think a lot of people don't really get that. Mm. I've got friends who... Uh, you know, younger friends uh, who haven't had kids, and you talk to them and they say, well, we're not... We've got a dog at the minute. We probably won't bother for a little bit yet. Um, and, and But of course... Uh, for the massive majority of people still, that, that is a, re- a reasonable position to take until it isn't, you know. And uh, the, exactly. the, So I'm yeah. like, I, I want to almost evangel- evangelise. Well, just find out, will you, now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even if you're not going to do anything for two years, why don't you go and find out now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's what I've said to them. I've said, look, I'm not, I wouldn't want to sort of put a dampener on it, but you're assuming that the second you'll start trying, you'll conceive. You're like, oh, I'll pencil it in for 2000 and. 26. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we did that. To. Did you do we, we all did that, I think. I think so. I mean, we, me and my partner, we've said, right, you know, once we've got married, then we'll yeah. start and all this. And then we were a really long time before we sort of went, do you know what? I'm, I don't think this is happening, is it? What's what's going on? And then when you first go to the doctor in the NHS and you refer, they go, well, you know, just relax. Just relax. Go on holiday. It'll be all right. And we're like, yeah, I don't, I, okay, well, we'll try that. And then you go back and you go, it's still not happening. And like, yeah, but you're young. And we're sort of sat there thinking, well, relatively, we're actually not. You know, we were kind of in our late 30s, wow. uh, uh, very late 30s, and then we're still saying we were young. And, and my wife was sort of thinking, well, I'm not uh, at all, so I don't know where. And and it is kind of like, I don't want to say that you get palmed off, because that's not the wrong. They were, they were very, you know, considered and they were nice, but but they didn't 
they really didn't take it seriously quick enough, I don't think, for if there was an issue to be able to do something quick enough, if, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do, I do. So what happened? Uh, well, luckily, uh, we were referred, uh, we had a couple of, uh, well, we had one failed attempt, and then on the second attempt, we we caught on. Did you know um, those numbers before this morning when I talked about the, the percentage of, and this is a, a, a 42% in, in the younger age group, but it drops to 26% for your age group. Did you know you were that lucky at the time? What, one in four chance? Um, I think, no. I don't no, think I don't we think did. We I think, did I think we kn- no, we knew it was unlikely, um, but we didn't know just how unlikely. Uh, I think you just blindly follow it. You just become so desperate. Yeah by that point that you try not to think about it you just think well we're just going to have to plow on really and just hope um, and we were you know lucky um, and then funnily enough a lot, everyone always said to us like, do you know what tends to happen when you have IVF it sort of resets everything and then you might catch on naturally and we were like yeah alright then in the same way if you go on holiday and relax it'll happen you know we just didn't really think and um, and we did. I hear this so, so often. I don't know that there's any statistics available for it, but I, I think it's got. It's probably to do with relaxing. Actually, it's probably you know because yeah. the stress is such a big thing. I've just found the article I wrote, Ben, just before before you came on, um, and and I mentioned that as I write this here. And then there was stress, one of the major obstacles to conception. Just thinking about being a Jaffa bracket seedless like the orange, get it, caused me untold stress. So with impeccable male logic, I insisted that I shouldn't think about it. And and of course, you can't not think about it. The stress is there all the time, and when you relax, perhaps. Um, everything improves. There's a couple of other lines in this article that I'll read to you after the news because I, I, I can't quite believe I wrote them, but it's my name at the top of the article from, from, from 2016. Ben, thank you. Uh, half past 11 is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. 32 minutes after 11 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where the, the, the consequences of uh, delaying the decision to start trying for a child are, are being examined. Um, and and it is always going to be an incredibly poignant conversation. It's an important one to have, A, because I, I, I hope this programme is a place where people can listen to and say things that they, they may not be able to encounter easily elsewhere in life. I know that's true for me. And, and also because, you know, it is um, forewarned is forearmed, if you like. I can't believe I was making jokes about it. Well, of course I can, because uh, we'd, we'd, our IVF had already been successful. So this is what I wrote in 2016. Um, your, your count is approximately 200,000 per milliliter, said the nice Scandinavian sperm counter to whom I had handed my cup some four hours previously. That sounds OK, I replied hopefully. And then I write, I follow Kidderminster Harriers Football Club, where match attendances of 2,000 are considered mighty, so you can perhaps understand my optimism, if not my ignorance. The average is 20 million, she told me. Oh, and most of yours aren't moving. Those are the moments where you think it might never happen. And happily, as with Ben, for us it did. But we're talking today, really, about the realisation that you are in the constituents of people for whom it won't. Louise is in Bromley. Louise, what would you like to say? Hello, hi James, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, Okay, so I am... um, speaking to your producer. Unfortunately, I find myself in a circumstance that um, I didn't envisage. Right. Um, I was in a long-term relationship and unfortunately, um, this young chap's behaviour um, led to the destruction of our relationship. Right. Um, and it was incredibly devastating. Um, I, well, at different points through the course of our relationship, I found myself wanting to sort of sort of have kids, but sort of not feeling that this was the person. Right. Um, and they sort of then sort of insisted, you know, that we will make this work, things will be okay, blah, blah, blah. And now I find myself at the age of 30, and I'm not interested in waiting for, for any man um, So, So the, uh, the, the I mean, urge I'm, to be I'm, a parent? I've got, everything I, I've got everything I need. I've got... I've got a uterus that works. I've got. I'm. If, if anything, I'm. I'm at a prime stage. If anything, and my statistics. Um, well, anyone at the age of thirty, and um, for IVF, at this point in time, this is the perfect time. So I'm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save some embryos. 
Yeah. I think oh, my I just the uh, phone line's just gone there. I, I, I try and get you back, Louise. Um, and I, if I've understood what you're telling me correctly, then I can. I wish you enormous amounts of luck. Uh, because it is a, it's a tricky business ahead. Tw- 25 minutes to 12 is the time. Uh, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm getting quite a lot of these, Evie, so I-, I hope there's some sort of comfort in numbers. I'm sorry, James, I'm just not strong enough to call in with my experience yet. Um, and, and Mark makes a point, I think, calmly, and, uh, and, and, and you use words like people, so this is nice. I, I, a day like today, I'll always get a... Um, I'll always get someone ringing in, blaming it all on feminism or, or claiming that women need to, uh, you know, a woman's place is in the home. But but Mark makes a much more powerful and, and empathetic point when he writes, we've created a society that means both partners need to work. We need a society where people have more choice. People have more choice. And, and I think he's got a point. I think that the demographics, the cost of living, all of those things will, will contribute to a... Hey, I, you know, your presumption of a certain standard of living that uh, w- would become unsustainable with the arrival of children. Um, Matt's in Lincoln. Matt, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, um, mate. First time calling in to you. Um, you weren't expecting this when you woke up this morning, were you? I wasn't, mate, no. I was, uh, <laughs> I, to be honest, I was in an and over the past half an hour to pick the phone up because well, it is a, it's a delicate issue. Of and, course it is. But, uh, yeah, me and my partner, we've been together nine years and we started when... IVF, I don't know, what was it, seven years ago? Right. When she was 33, eight years ago. Um, and we tried to do, we knew originally that it wouldn't be possible. I've always known since 25 when I had um, lymphoma. Right. And the doctors told me it wasn't going to be happening. Like you, when we've had one cycle, they had all the nurses there picking out individual sperm to try and get that's enough for that cycle. Ixy, exactly yeah. that. Um, so we've done two. Uh, we've had to privately fund them because the Clinical Care Commission in, in this area refuses to give um, male people who've had cancer, whose partners have kids from previous relationships funding, so we were denied at appeal. Yeah. Um, so we've self-funded two, um, the cost of about 20 grand in this country. We've now got a last gasp attempt kind of thing, um, which we're going to go abroad for, just for financial reasons to get the most... Um, add-ons because it's the add-ons that has the cost yeah um to try it uh, now i i know the percentages are are not good um and i'm kind of fatalistic about it right but my partner's just blind optimism and i can't see anything else she's not and that worries um, you it, it, of course it does because, because the, f- the, the minute you are, you're the riding the wave you of it'll work it'll work yeah but then you, you have to be like that i think you have to be like that or, or at least i understand why she is like that you've got to go into it with everything crossed essentially yeah yes so from her place she's she suffers with her mental health she's, oh, she's just completed a phd at the same time of doing it so immensely proud of her for that but the pressure um, that she's putting <clears> herself <throat> under is, is you exactly worry that. it might be unbearable but she has children of her own did you say she has two, yes. But, well, but, we have two. But, but yeah, but yeah so forgive me. But the, but, but the biological impulse here is stronger in her than it is in you because you've had your entire adult life to come to terms with the possibility. Have I, have I got that right? Well, when we got both got together, obviously she, at that point she was petrified, to be honest, that there was going to be a third because she said she got pregnant so easily. Right. And I had to convince her that, no, it was okay. Yeah, um, all right, mate, let's not go. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. But um, no, obviously, it quickly became clear, and she realised what had gone on. And because she has a biological background, once I told her what kind of chemotherapy she had, right? Um, she knew she knew the stats. But I'm just um, what, what I'm, I'm, we decided I'm, we wanted to. Yeah, but you, the reason why you can be fatalistic about it is because, in fact, the more you tell me, the more sense this situation makes. So you can be fatalistic about it because you'd kind of confronted that that status, if you like, um, at 25, and 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 she, however approach the question of pregnancy with with um a, a degree of surprise at how easy it was so you i mean it's an incredible clash of experience isn't it really and yeah exactly uh, both hers were unplanned and caught her by surprise and she wasn't particularly looking for kids so right. it was a, a kind of i've got my partner now and i want this happy kind of unit and i want the baby with that oh. and then it became all consuming so your fatalism is is probably quite healthy because you're worried more about the impact of it not working on your partner than you are about you not becoming a biological parent, I think. For sure. Oh, sure. Mate, you're a good man, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. You really are. But it's well, hard. And anybody trying, like, the delays, I work away, so 
Yeah. And I work in places where Zika is a factor, so you have to get the test every time you come back to make sure you haven't got Zika, even though I've had it, which right. is ridiculous. But uh, it just it goes on and on. So it's, I mean, it's we a... were supposed to be done in two years, and we're seven years later. Hopefully, going next month, we'll see. Well, keep in touch, yeah. And, be- and best of luck. Seriously, I'd say it's 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 a it's a lonely, lonely time, which I think is why sometimes we we turn our attention to these topics and give people an opportunity to offload in a way that they may not get in many other places. But but um, a, but a lot of people will be thinking of you as you as you approach this hurdle and that contrast, there, tension between fatalism and 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 boundless optimism, both. Perfectly logical approaches to it. I guess it's a part of personality type. It's glass half empty versus glass half full, isn't it? I mean, it really is that simple. If you're glass half full, then it's absolutely going to work. Don't care what the percentage is. A five percent success rate. Well, I'll be one of the five percent. I know I will. And then glass half empty is it's a five percent success rate. I'm preparing myself for the uh, uh, high likelihood that this is that this is not our time. Um, the 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 realization that that. That it is not. I, I don't know. I don't want to trivialize it, but it, it's a bit like, in purely syntactical terms, it's a little bit like the conversations that we've had over the years about home ownership. If you're of a certain generation and a certain background, you always presumed that you would be a homeowner at some point in the future. And parenting is exactly the same. You always presumed that you would be a parent. And to, to come up against the realization that you might not be, is something that we really need to talk about more as a society. Uh, that is why the Human Embryo um, uh, uh, for Fertilization and Embryology Authority has, has put out this research. It's why it's put out this warning. It sits alongside anxieties about our falling birth rate, lowest since 2002, demographics, healthcare, social care crises on, on, on the horizon, all sorts of things. But delaying motherhood... Um, makes it more likely that motherhood never happens. Charlie's in Sidcup. Charlie, what would you like to say? Yeah, hello, James. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Um, very nervous. Yeah, it's only me. It's only me. Uh, we, we we actually, I'm the same age as you, and then my birthday's in January as well. Oh, blimey. Capricorn. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, me and my wife, we've been together since we were 16. We've done three IVFs here, funded by myself. Yeah. No, nothing. Um, the NHS wouldn't do wouldn't do it at all. Why not? Um, I don't know, really. Right. They, they, because I was working and she was working, and I, I really don't know. But okay. We went to the Hilton Hotel to see a company in Greece. Right. And then we flew to Greece to try it there, and nothing. Mm. Um, how long ago was this, Charlie? What, how old were you when you went down, when you realised that it... I was um, 28. Oh, wow. But so when going... I was 26, I had Guillain-Barre syndrome. Right. And within a day and a half, I was completely paralysed. All I could see out was my left eye, oh the tracking. Days. I was like that for four months, with my wife literally sleeping beside me. Yeah. And then I had a collapsed lung and pneumonia and other things. So it might, have been your, it might have been your health record that meant the NHS weren't going to help you then? Yeah, but, yeah, basically. And I think my sperm was doing a backstroke, like you said. I <laughs> wouldn't laugh about it, but yeah. I think, <laughs> you know we are, I mean? I think you and me are allowed to laugh about it, Charlie. Yeah, but the, the thing that gets me is... Go on. You know, I've got four brothers. I'm a twin. Right. They've all got four kids. Um, my mum sort of puts me as a black sheep, if you like. Yeah. We don't get invited to no birthday parties or barbecues or nothing like that. Really? Yeah, really, yeah. Because they... Mate, yeah, don't, don't get phone calls from them or nothing. And you think I mean, it's because wife, because uh, because the family dynamic is that if 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 there's no kids, then there's no point. Yeah, exactly, mate. Oh, yeah, that's, Charlie, that's, that's what, grossly that's unfair. Yeah. That is grossly unfair. I'm yeah, sorry. and I know it bothers me. What if the culture yeah, does? Of course, um, it bothers me because you can hear. But it bothers me now, Charlie. <laughs> I've been through a lot. I've got I've got lupus. I've got a male hip. I've had an heart attack. I've had all sorts, and I'm still working. I'm a welder. Blimey! And uh, yeah, just how old were just, you when you realised uh, when you when you? I'm going to use the words "gave up," but because uh, they're the only ones I can think of. But when, when about yeah, about thirty, right? Just wasn't around that happen. age. We both we spent the fortune, and we just in the end we was like, you know, at the end That's of the it. day, what what else can we do? But you still love the bones of each other. 
Oh, we've been together since we were 16. She had a miscarriage and everything. But oh. I love her. I love her the bits. I really do. We're, we're, we're the same as we was when we were 16. That's special. Well, that <laughs> makes you, like, you lucky. And, and, you know, there'll be days when you don't feel lucky. And, and I, I mean, it almost sounds, I don't want to be rude, but it, if, if your family can't reach out to you after what you've been through, then you might be better off without them than you would be with them, Charlie. But that's not... That's, that's, yeah, but that's exactly how, how I feel. Do oh, you know what I mean? I don't... I do. I don't. Um, my wife's mum and dad absolutely treat me like their son, and they have since I was sixteen. That's lovely. You know, I do everything for them. They do everything for me. That he's, her mum loves me to bits. You know, I love them, and that's that's how, that's my life. My mum and the, the others, we don't we don't even speak on the phone. So you need yeah, that's, You got love in your life. Yeah. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, and, and absolutely. My wife keeps me going, literally, because <laughs> at some stages I was thinking, you know, you're a nobody. Yeah. You've got nothing. You know, you see other people with their kids in the park and everything. I used to take my, my brother's young kid with me everywhere. Spain, he come everywhere with us when he was growing up. Oh. And I loved it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is, isn't it? It is what it is. Does it still hurt a bit when you see kids running yeah, around? Yeah, it does. Oh, absolutely sure, does, yeah. Mate. It's Absolutely good that you can definitely. talk about it because I'll tell you one thing for nothing: if you if you bottle it up, it hurt, it, it hurt, helps nobody at all. Oh, honestly, I wasn't going to ring because I was so nervous. Well, you, you know what I mean? But you I haven't to... spoke to. Them. I'm glad I have because I haven't spoke to anyone like this. You know, I've not. It's been hard going. You know, I feel like I've really a bit of tension. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm very honoured that you chose to do it here. I really am because yeah, cause I I'm, think I I'm, hope that it will have done you a power of good, actually. Yeah, and I'm honoured to speak to you. I'm, oh, really just gonna, I'm gonna uh, read you one text. I'm gonna read you two yeah. texts, all right? One's yeah. from Sarah and she says, Can you tell Charlie he's always welcome at our family gatherings? <laughs> and and Tasnim is in Radlet and she says, Oh Charlie, you're welcome to our barbecues and birthday parties anytime you want. I'll wait for the invites. <laughs> <laughs> you might there you go, mate. All right, we'll talk yeah. again. I look forward yeah, to it. Yeah, you take care, mate. Thank you, you take Charlie. Care. Thank you for that. Mate, thank you. God bless. It's eleven forty seven. It is 11.49 and I don't think anybody will be remotely surprised to hear the uh, the outpouring of, of, of love and respect for Charlie, our, our, our last caller, who I, I think will be pretty hard to follow, actually. We're about to go to Blenheim Palace to talk to LBC's political correspondent, Aggie Chambre, about what's going on there. But I want, if I may, to return to something that I touched on before, and I think I may have got it wrong. Um, when I when I said it's right for this story to be written as women are waiting too long to have babies, which is the first line that the Time chose in its coverage, because of course it it it, it I mean thirty percent or so of um, infertilities within couples are as ours was a consequence of the man's medical condition. So if if you end up not having a child because your male partner put off going for the tests, put off admitting that there was a problem, put off um, acknowledging that you might need help, then I think the way that story is written would probably rankle with you, wouldn't it? Women are leaving it too long. Women are waiting too long to have babies. When you, you've been trying to have a baby for years, but your partner, who you subsequently discover, and I've got nothing but sympathy for him because I was him, um, is, is the obstacle to conception. That's not the right way to phrase it. I don't know what the right way is, and the uh, the rather brilliant Elizabeth Day, the, the, the superb author and podcaster, has made this point on Twitter. She writes, it's um, infertility is depicted here, and she's using The Guardian's coverage, I chose The Times, exclusively as a woman's issue. Over 30% of IVF is as a result of male fertility problems. It's not just women who are, quotes, desperate for a child. And yet here these old tropes are again in an article written by a man, which quotes, a man. Um, just some, some, some food for thought. Change of pace, not as big as a change of pace on the horizon at 12 noon when we dive into mystery. The last one for a couple of weeks. I, uh, taking a well-deserved, well, I think it's well-deserved. You might not. I'm taking a well-deserved holiday. You're in for some treats next week, I can tell you. You're in for some big surprises with my, uh, with my holiday cover. Uh, some of which you will like, some of which you may not, but hey-ho. Uh, all human life will be here. Um, Aggie Chambre is at Blenheim Palace, where Sir Keir Starmer is hosting this European summit of, of pretty much every European leader there is, not just ones in the in the European Union. Otherwise, Keir Starmer wouldn't be there. Um, Aggie, what's going on? 
Well, yes, I'm sitting in these sort of literally palatial grounds on a beautiful day in Blenheim Palace. And yeah, as you say, more luck for Keir Starmer as this was organised before he won the election. Uh, and he's having, he says, and his uh, team says, he's having an upbeat, good reception from the European leaders. People have been re- arriving this morning. And basically what they want today is to try and sort of change the narrative around their relationship, try and reset. I think that's the word of the day. They want there to be and recognition about irregular migration and criminal smuggling gangs facilitating that. And they want to acknowledge that's a shared problem, which will require shared solutions and cooperations. But yes, they say warm, good vibes. And we've actually been hearing from Sir Keir Starmer in the last hour. We are resetting our approach here. This government will not commit taxpayer money to gimmicks. We are here to serve our country in the national interest in pursuit of solutions that will actually deliver results. And more than that, we will approach this issue with humanity and with a profound respect for international law. And that's why we scrapped the unworkable Rwanda scheme on day one. And it's why we will never withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. It's interesting as well, the setting that we're in, obviously, Winston Churchill's uh, birthplace, who was a big campaigner on ECHR as well. So Keir Starmer, in that speech opening this summit, said it's a chance to say no more and reflecting on the recent deaths in the in the channel as well. Announcement we expect to happen later today is an announcement on aid, so increasing uh, foreign aid to spend to kind of counter migration to the UK. There was some talk about potentially talk of some uh, returns deals. David Lammy, the Foreign Secretary, said that wasn't true this morning. But it is interesting that Sir Keir Starmer has chosen to have dinner with one person tonight, and that is the French President Emmanuel Macron. So we do expect that to sort of be another opportunity for him to try and reset those uh, relationships with France. Um, that's, it's very interesting. So this is as much about tone as it is about substance, I think, if I've understood you correctly. It is, it's I about think, yes. essentially, I, 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 to, to use a French, I think it's a French word, it's about an, an aura of rapprochement rather than this sort of division that has been typified in relations with the European Union since 2016. I think that's exactly right. And sometimes with these summits, there's a sort of communique at the end. Everyone comes to some big agreement. That's not the case here. It's more of a Mm. sort of speed dating kind of thing. It's an opportunity (laughs) for them all to have chats. They've got a family photo. They've got lots of bilats uh, written into the diary already. And it will be an opportunity for people to have these brush buys, to have these chats. And for Sir Keir Starmer and his Home Secretary and his Foreign Secretary and others in his government who are here as well to just slightly reset it. You know, they called it a botched deal that Britain had with the EU during the election campaign and all of that uh, it will be interesting to see and and obviously as we had European leaders arriving this morning uh, you know they said a few words as they arrived before they got a handshake or a a clutch on the shoulder from Sir Keir Starmer and some said great you know really happy to be here this is all going to go really well and some of them said you know one of them said well the UK can't cherry pick so although some European leaders are delighted that Sir Keir Starmer is now in charge others are a bit more unsure and there is a lot he says he wants to do and it will be interesting to see how much he's actually able to do uh, without really ruffling some feathers. But so his ruthless caution is on display again really because he's not allowed anybody really to get their hopes up I, don't, I doubt he's got his own hopes up but but it is a step to towards, I'm going to use the word rapprochement again, and, and just to, to talk briefly, Aggie, about those other leaders, I, I think still in this country there's enormous levels of, of misapprehension and ignorance about how the European Union actually functions. The prospect of a non-member getting anything at all that a member hasn't got is absolute kryptonite, particularly to the, to the smaller members. Yeah, that's right, and, and, and basically, you know, this relationship is really difficult, and, you know, some, someone was reporting that uh, you know, Elton John uh, endorsed Labour during the election campaign. And apparently one of the things that he really wanted was it to, it to be easier for touring musicians uh, to basically tour around Europe. And that was something that Labour said to him, apparently, that they would look at. But actually, that's something that's really difficult yeah. and you might have to actually open up the contracts. So it's all it's all really difficult. And all kind of, as you say, it's skating on thin ice because Britain needs to work out how they can get things, but they can't get too much because then people will be annoyed. And it's all just complicated. And as you say, to 
today is about vibes today is setting up those relationships and trying to sort of make it a bit easier to negotiate in the future but they are saying you know today is not a negotiation and, and, and that's the point because if we were to be talking about the buttering of parsnips there wouldn't be much of it going on they're, they're not going to come out with sort of uh, codified wins or, 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 or statements of things that are about to change except domestically I suppose as well as um, internationally uh, some people particularly uh, on the left of the Labour movement um, persuaded that Keir Starmer m might as well be a member of the Conservative Party that pledge to never leave the European Convention of Human Rights is, is proper clear blue water isn't it between Labour this government and its predecessor which threatened to do so all the time every, every time they sort of stood up it seems sometimes yeah, exactly. And I thought it was interesting here, hearing Sir Keir Starmer talk just then. He was talking about, you know, he's loved international law ever since he was at Leeds studying law and talked about how much it's meant to him ever since. So, yeah, absolutely right. Clear blue water. And also mentioning there the fact that they won't be sending anyone to Rwanda as well. Another bit of clear blue water that he does just want to make those points and to try and improve his relationship with Europe early on. Yeah. So if I were to if I were to sum up the attitude of most European leaders, it would be we're very glad that the adults are back in the room but don't expect us to give you anything for nothing. I think you've nailed it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aggie Chambre reporting to you live from Blenheim Palace, where, do you know, I, I didn't think it would be appropriate to mention this during my conversation with Aggie, but the lawns of Blenheim Palace, uh, 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 where one of my daughters took their first steps on the, on the lawns of Blenheim Palace. The other one uh, took, took their first steps on a, a little patch of grass outside a motorway service station in Devon. So I don't know, it'd be interesting to see whether that has any bearing upon their, their paths in life, one of them. Um, I don't know, I, I did, but, but um, it just came back to me there because I'm still a little bit discombobulated and, and moved by the conversations that we've been having this hour, particularly like a lot of you. Um, uh, the, the one we had towards the end with, uh, with, with, with Charlie, just remembering the um, uh, earliest days of my little ones, little ones' lives. Um, and that is it for today. Uh, apologies to, to Kadisha and to others that we are moving on, but um, it was an important conversation to have, even if it was at times a very difficult one for me as much as, as, as anybody else. But it is Thursday and it is approaching 12 noon, which means only one thing. It is your weekly opportunity. Well, not weekly. It's your final opportunity for three weeks. There'll be no mystery hour next week and there'll be no mystery hour the week after. So this is your last chance for three weeks to get an answer to the question that has had you puzzled for the longest time to achieve the sort of uh, satisfaction that is not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. The way it works is very straightforward. Um, you ring in with a question and then you ring in with an answer. Not just you, obviously we mix it up a bit, everybody gets involved and the questions can cover any grounds at all that you like. They can be silly, they can be serious, they can be scientific, they can be something that perhaps has only ever occurred to you. The only rule we have is that you don't look up anything before ringing in with your solution. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation, Mystery Hour, with James O'Brien. Oh, three minutes after 12 is the time and everyone can, can relax. A uh, nice, uh, frolicsome hour lies ahead of us. Uh, if you're not familiar with this feature from the programme, two things you need to know. It's incredibly different from the other 14 hours of the week that we spend together. And uh, it, it's, it's funny. I, I often guarantee that you will have at least one laugh out loud moment. Otherwise, you get a full refund for your price of entry. Uh, you also need to know that there is a prize these days for my favourite contribution of the week, and that prize is a Mystery Hour board game. Um, I, I, I think we're going to have some news in the field of the Mystery Hour board game soon, but I haven't yet returned the call of the fantastic bloke who runs the Mystery Hour board game company because I've had a, an exceedingly busy week, but I shall do so after the show, and then when I return from my holiday, uh, I can bring you up to date with all the latest developments. Um, you can find the terms and conditions for that competition at lbc.co.uk. I went a bit early then. Was that? that was a sort of premature um, cessation of my conversation, a pr premature pr premature conversation cessation there. I don't know why. I thought it sounded like it was going da ding da ding da ding da ding but I came out a few bars early. Um, Richard speaks for many of you this morning when he writes, Oh, Lord, James is going on holiday. I expect some kind of major geopolitical, he geopolitical upheaval to land at 10.01 on Monday morning. We've had a pretty good run of being here for the big stuff lately but you're you're absolutely right um there, there have been some fairly uh, uh remarkable 
coincidences when it comes to me not being here for moments of major national import. But uh, anyway, fingers crossed. And you can also find out more about the board game at mysteryhour.co.uk. Um, I am... I, I am going. I've done the T's and C's. I said they're at lbc.co.uk. I am going to catch up with Fraser Knight at some point this hour on the uh, findings, the early findings of that uh, report into the COVID crisis, in, in, into the, the the COVID inquiry. I know Sheila will be talking about it at much greater length and in much more depth. Uh, during her programme, but the idea that the UK government and the devolved nations failed their citizens means that it, it could, perhaps in a in a normal country, be conducted in a slightly less partisan fashion than, than we might otherwise expect. But Fraser will bring us up to date with some of the early findings um, that that report contains. Five minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, that's it, is it? Just crack straight on, I think, shall we? Yes, we shall. Yes, we shall. David is in Wigan. David, question or answer? Uh, it's a question, please. That's our second call from Wigan today. Um, it's a big in Wigan. Carry on. What is it? <laughs> uh, I was listening to the, the King's speech the other day, mm. uh, and he was reading everything out that his government was going to do. And my head's one of those heads that sort of wanders off. And I was thinking, when you're at school... There's always a child that sort of reads out like that with no inflection and no emphasis or anything. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if the king did that? Was reading it out, you know, like, my government is going to do I this. Think it, it wasn't so, far off that at the last one. There was a distinct you, lack of enthusiasm when he was doing Rishi Sunak's <laughs> king's speech, I felt. I think that was more contempt, on it, really? It may have been. It may have but, been. Uh, I just started laughing. I thought it was funny. And it made me think, like, with people, there's some people in there that no matter what you do, you cannot get them to hold a note when they're singing. Yeah. And I was thinking... Hello, that's me. It, are there people that do that when they're reading? That no matter what you do, you could not teach them to read with inflection and to pace the sentence and, and to emphasise in the right oh, place. Oh, that's interesting. But no matter what you did, they would always speak like that when they were reading. I'm thinking, do you know, at our school, it was the lad who's got a little bit of fame on this programme for saying, what was it like? He always had the, the very monotonous reading voice. But, I, I mean, it could be because they're finding reading harder than some of us do, than the rest of us but do. So. Th- this is it. But the, the, the saying, the, the, like I say, the same works with singing as well. So Yeah, but I, they I mean, don't I, talk I, like that normally. If they're having a conversation with you, they're not like, all right, David, what, how are you today? Do you see what I mean? Ah, but the th- yeah, but the, the thing is, you, you, the, the, the mo- like my wife, for example, and I hope she's not listening, mm. she sings along to songs in the <laughs> kitchen or whatever, but she's dreadful. And you're like, surely you can hear that that is, that is oh, bad. That so is maybe, they, maybe it's nothing to do with the, the, their inability to read or the struggle to read or anything like that. Maybe they just can't tell that they're doing it. And I was wondering, or, uh, is it possible? Is it, you know, other people that just, no matter what you do, you would not be able to change that no matter how much you And, and it's specific to reading. We're not just talking about people with boring voices. In a way, we're talking about people who don't have boring voices in normal conversation, but who, whenever they just start when reading, just when they're reading, sound like, like human Mogadon. To... Who the hell is going to know the answer to this? Well, who knows? And, and could they sing? Well, I imagine they could sing. <laughs> imagine they could sing perfectly in tune, but the minute you get them to read aloud, they talk like that. There was a, there was a lad at school with a stammer who um, uh, used to sing. It, the, the teacher would tell him to sing it rather than speak it, and something would relax inside him, and he'd be able to, while reading, he'd be able to read his his passage from whatever play we were doing, or whatever we were reading in class. But he would sing it, and it would not not stammer any at all. Actually, not just less. Um, David, I like that question, although I'm not quite sure how I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, is it possible if you if you've got a really mon- monotonic is that a word monotonous? If you've got a monotonous reading voice, is it possible to introduce Inflection and and character. O oh, oh, three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. I like that question, but I'd be amazed if it gets a proper answer. Alan is in Bromsgrove. Alan, question or answer? It's a question. Carry on, Alan. Oh yeah, uh, I've, I've been wondering for a while. I ended up in a um, uh, a cafe that was once a church. And oh yeah. Was Where, was that? Where was that? Where was that? Where uh, was that? It was in Dublin. Oh in okay. Dublin, which right. is unusual that they would change. Many churches there, but anyway, wow. um, and uh, I was I was um, thinking while they're heating it with this this radiator system, and I thought, well, how do they used to heat churches when they built them? And I thought, and cathedrals, etc. And they didn't have fireplaces. Obviously, central heating had been invented, so why didn't they use fireplaces and chimneys? And I thought, why don't they build churches and cathedrals with chimneys? Uh, because they used to build castles with chimneys and fireplaces. So why haven't cathedrals got? What an amazing, uh, what an amazing question. I, I did, 
I can't. I, some, I mean, after well, all the years we've been doing this, I'm always slightly uplifted when something pops up that we've never come close to before. Right. And I've spent a lot of time yeah, in churches I, I, over I, the years. Yeah, and they have. I mean, they have obviously, you know, you go around some big cathedrals and those sort of big round sort of central heating type systems are they in do there. do now, but so well, I mean, they may have had people, some sort yeah. of underfloor, like water, but I don't think... I suppose that, that, yeah. that they're either full or empty, aren't they, back in the day, when, when churches were built and congregations were huge. Yeah. They'd maybe. either be full or empty, and the minute that they're full, um, they don't... I mean, maybe they, they heat themselves up. They heat awake. themselves up. Well, there's also the fact yeah. that they're not supposed to be places of comfort and, 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 and repose. They're supposed to be places oh. of, of penance and... I thought paying attention i like Are it they? i thought they would be uplifting and, and make you feel better about no, not when they were built a future not when they were built when Maybe they were not. built it's yeah. all about fire and brimstone oh well except there isn't any fire or brimstone which is why they're so cool so what yeah well, i yeah. mean there's two questions here in a way how were churches were churches heated at all back in the day but but the real question yeah. is how come they didn't have any fireplaces well, every other building built in the same era would have had fireplaces yeah. and chimneys, crucially. In yeah. fact, you'd have thought I mean, that the, the thought, spire would be a great opportunity yeah. to have a whopping great chimney. Oh, yeah. Big fire in the middle been, of the church. It would have brought you to the church, wouldn't it? It would have brought you yeah. to known it was on. It was time. You see, wouldn't have needed bells. You'd yeah. have just had a big plume of smoke coming Absolutely. out the top. I like this question. It may well have an answer that makes us both go, oh, yeah, of course. But I, I don't at the moment. I don't at the moment have an inkling of what that what that answer might be. I also haven't got any paper in the studio today. So, Keith, you need you to remember all the questions that have gone so far, and then I'll recap during the next hiatus and start taking some notes, OK? Darren is in Epsom. Darren, question or answer? A question. Carry on. Can you hear the sun? No, nothing, nothing coming. Can you? I can't hear, <laughs> but um, I'm sure with uh, all the... Um, reactions and whatever it is that creates the heat sound is produced at some point yeah, well this is a, a variation on the question about the tree falling down in the forest when there's nobody there to hear it isn't it i suppose so yeah because because well, well yeah but also is that i mean do you not need some sort of atmosphere in order to be able to hear things i don't know because you can pick up sound with lasers with all sorts of other devices. So what, what is, we need, to, we need to zone in on the question. If we could get close to the sun, would we be able to hear it? Or is there a point at which you could hear the sun? If you got close enough to it. Yeah, okay. without getting frazzled. How often have you thought about this? Where did this question come from? I like it. It's just something that's been there. Yeah? What, the sun? <laughs> it's not today. It's, not say, well, it's still there, isn't it, Darren? Don't get all <laughs> philosophical on me. It's still there. It's just not necessarily playing a blinder at the moment in Epsom. Um, I like that. Can you hear the sun at all? I've got a feeling that you can't. And don't they say in space no one can hear you scream? Is that for the same reason? Hey, you, you've forgotten that, Darren. In space no one can hear you scream, remember? Oh, I'm not talking about screaming, I'm talking about the sun. Yeah, but they can't hear you scream because they can't hear anything. It's not specific to screaming. It's not like they could hear you sing, but they couldn't hear you scream. We shall see. Someone will know. I'm more confident that we'll get an answer to that one than I am to the one, um, to the first one. 12.13 is the time. Uh, Shlomi is in Manchester. Shlomi, question or answer? Question. Carry on. It bothered me quite a number of times over the past couple of years with all the prime ministerial changes we've yes. had. Um, so when Rishi Sunak, last year or two weeks ago, handed in his resignation to the king, he's no longer quite there. We then have an hour or two gap, or maybe even longer, until Keir Starmer gets to the king, um, gets told the nucleus and all of that. Who is the prime minister to make big decisions in that time, or are we just leaderless? So if the Russians invaded? Yeah. While in the inter interregnum, as it were, between an outgoing and an incoming prime minister who well i mean it would be the it would be the incoming one wouldn't it or would well, it he's got no, he doesn't know what to do he doesn't know how to how to get the new kids he hasn't up. got the briefcase he doesn't know the codes he doesn't he hasn't got yeah. the, i don't know how much of this is sort of accurate but you're right he hasn't got the agency so so is there someone who is holding the fort so to speak yeah in the interim I like that. I, we could ask that fellow who said that um, when, when Keir Starmer revealed that he was going to spend Friday evenings, if he could, with his 
with his family. So, someone should have pointed that out to J.D. Vance earlier this week, shouldn't they? As, uh, uh, this Islamist nuclear power where the Prime Minister does Friday night dinner with his Jewish wife. Uh, uh, a bit of a mystery there. But, but one of the Tories came out and said, um, what if the Russians invade? After six o'clock on a Friday, maybe he'd know the answer to this question. I think it was Greg Hands. If you're listening, Greg, give us a ring. So there may be nobody, although that seems unlikely, but there is probably somebody. Can we work out who it is? Do we know who it is in that little period between prime ministers who's in charge of national security in general or the nuclear codes in particular? 12.15 is the time. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. Well, I've never heard of that before. I don't read a lot of texts during Mystery Hour, but... um. It's a real thing. Do you? All right, I'm going to do a little bit of a teaser for you. We haven't done any teasers today. I don't, do you know what champing is? Don't look it up. Do not look it up. You're not allowed to look anything up during Miss Jar anyway. But do you know what? I've never heard it. I, I, do you know, I would have quite fancied that when the kids were younger, but I don't know if Mrs. O'Brien would have gone for it. Do you know what champing is? Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is? It's, it's, it's really interesting that. I'm go, I don't look it up. See if, see if you know. Uh, 17 minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, if you have a very monotonous reading voice, can you be taught to read with uh, character and inflection and, and lots of energy? Why don't churches have chimneys? Uh, and or how did they heat them back in the day? Does the sun make a sound? I like church chimney. It's making me think of D Dick Van Dyke. Church chimney, D, church chimney, church chimney. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then when the PMs are swapping around, what happens to the nuclear codes? Quite a lot to get into here. Rianne is in Hollyhead. Rianne, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well. Question or answer? It's an answer. Oh. To, to the reading without inflection yes. question. Um, so when children learn to read, they have to use three queuing systems. And to read proficiently, you need to see, sort of be juggling all three of those balls in the air at the same time. Okay. So one, one of them is a, a, a sort of graphophonic, so it's about letters and sounds. Yeah. So hence young children, you say, sound it out. Yeah. Then the next one is syntax. If you don't know a word, what's the, what's the word that would fit into that sentence? Yeah. And the last one, and the most important one, is meaning. And people who read without inflection tend to be reading without picking up the meaning of what they're reading. And so what happens is, because you're not reading the meaning, you can't put any inflection into it because you're not making sense of what you're reading. And so adults who do it tend to be adults who haven't mastered all three queuing systems and you can teach for it because you have to listen to your own voice while you're reading. But it is possible to do it, but some people will never be great at it. Oh, how interesting. Have you, have you I mean, what, well, hang on, what are your qualifications? Uh, well, I was a, a teacher and a head teacher, and I specialised in my degree at children acquiring reading. Yeah, that'll do. Is there... A, a particular case you remember? Was there a child who s sort of came in to see you like this? Uh, Sir Keir Starmer will begin a push to secure... And then by the end of it, they were they were sounding like Ian McKellen? Uh, well, I tend, towards the end of my career, I worked with um, teenagers who hadn't acquired reading and weren't oh, proficient. Yeah. And so they were the children that you tended to howl at. I remember one child reading... Um, Private Peaceful by Michael Morpurgo and oh. getting to a really, really touching part of it and reading it like, like a robot. And the whole class was laughing. Oh. And, it, and, it, and it's a shame because he had no idea what he was reading. And actually, they're the ones that if you ask them afterwards what they've read, they have no clue. How and bizarre. they get that feeling that, you know, if you're sitting in a circle and the teacher says, read one by one, yes. all they're doing is counting down until it, they know it's going to be their turn to read. And they have no idea what they're reading. Oh, it's sad, isn't it? Is there anything you can do about it? Well, you, you teach them to listen to their own voice while they're reading. And it changes quite quickly, I'd imagine, if they can get the hang of it. Well, it, it does for some children and it doesn't for others. Some of them... Yes, that's, you know, that's what I mean, if, if they can get their hang of it. Yeah. 
And oh. they're usually the people who don't read for pleasure because they, they don't have that ability. Even when they're not reading out loud? They've still... Yeah. No, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Is, there, is there anywhere adults can go? Because a couple of people, Phil, at, at the front of the queue, I think is, 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 is the adult you've just described. Is there anything he can do to, to improve his situation? Well, ironically, it's, it's like learning to drive. You learn to drive by driving. So it is and one of those, yeah. You learn to read by reading. So, so the more you do read. it, the easier it gets. Absolutely. Oh, you're lovely. Would you like a round of applause? Oh, I'd love one. Well, I'll have this one on me. Thank you. That was a really lovely explanation. Um, in fact, Ian is suggesting that the board game has already uh, got its destination, but it's early days, Ian. It's early days. Uh, 12.22 is the time. Laura is in Wandsworth. Laura, question or answer? Uh, question for you, James. Carry on. So I recently heard that all clowns have to have a fully original clown makeup. Yes. My question is, how do they make sure theirs is completely individual? Is there some sort of clown trademark I, that they I have to get? I think there is, you know. I think there's an international oh. convention of clowns. Um, so and, I, and, I'm not talking, and I'm not talking about the Conservative Party. Uh, there is a, <laughs> the, the, and the, the, there is a, a kind of sketchbook, or I don't know what, and this is no way going to be the answer. But under there's any, something like that. But it just rings a bell. I think I just it just rings a bell. There's something to do with the with the shape with the with the makeup. Yeah, as you say, the the. the oh, I like that. I, I, I tell you what, I'll stop burbling, shall I, Laura, and just put the question on the board. <laughs> is that how do they know? Yeah, how how do they register their makeup? So how, as do they, it, how, as how do they know that, would... A that no one has done pretty much the same one before, and B that someone yeah. owns someone owns this one. Yeah. You're on. I like that. And I hope that one thank gets you very much. No, thank you very much. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. If you know the answer, don't let me go home without revealing what champing is. Uh it's not I haven't got any right answers yet, except from people who knew what the uh what what it meant already, and that doesn't count as a right answer. Uh, but then again, how would I know? Well, if you've done it, you're gonna know what it is. So if you send me a message saying, Oh, we've done it, it's great, then I'm gonna go, Well, that's not an answer to the mystery of what does champing mean. I like this. I don't know whether to feel sorry for your wife, Matt, or, or, or to consider her to be the second luckiest woman in the world. I listen to you every day, James, and now my wife says that I sound like you. Uh, Oz is in Brighton. Oz, question or answer? Oh, question, please, James. Carry on, Oz. Um, the colour orange, was it named after the fruit, or was the fruit named after the colour? Fruit came first, but I can't remember why. OK, because it's the same in Spanish, isn't it? Naranja. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Persian as well. There's some places you go uh, and it isn't the same at all. A golden apple yeah. is what it meant originally, like a golden oh. apple. And orange, as in William of Orange, that has nothing to do with uh, with the colour orange or, or, or with the with the fruit orange. So it is a coincidence. Yeah. But I, I, but I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to give myself a... I think it's Swedish. Uh, Swedish, the word. You can stick it on the board, James. Uh, no, I will. It's going on the board. I'm saying I don't think I can give myself a round of applause for this because it's... Um, <laughs> It's a pretty rubbish answer. Is the short? Is the no, short? That's right. the, no, like so or what? Yeah. What? So orange, the fruit and the yeah. colour. What? What's the derivation what, what, of both of them? Yeah. What? What? Na- what was named after what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know that it was. I gen- genuinely don't think either was named after either. I okay. think. I think they came from different roots. But but I need someone who sounds more convincing than I do, don't I? Really. I was, that sounds good to me. I don't mind. Thank yeah, you, mate. Happy either way. You you take care. I'll get you one for that. Twenty five after twelve is the time. Uh, Amelia is in Brentwood. Amelia, question or answer? Question, please. Car- carry on, Amelia. Okay, this is going to not shock you at all that we're calling from Brentwood asking questions like this. Uh-huh. This morning, my I don't have any. Hang on a minute. I, just, just, I don't have any preconceptions <laughs> about Brentwood. Why would I have preconceptions well, about you Brentwood? You after I ask this question. <laughs> so this morning, my mum was unloading the dishwasher, and she went, "Oh, it's really annoying when you have a Tupperware box. Yeah, the bottom <laughs> part, like the box, dries, mm. but the lid stays wet." Now, the lady on the phone we spoke to before said, is it because there's grooves in the lid that would collect the water, but there's grooves in the box? And mum, all our different kinds of Tupperware, small ones, big ones, and the lid is wet and the box is dry. And we want to know, is there some sort of like scientific reason yes. why the box dries and the lid doesn't? Well, they're different. It's not. They, is the Tupperware identical? Is the material on the lid the same as the material for the box? That is true for some of them, but we've got one that's like a glass bottom and a plastic top. Yeah. And the glass bottom's dried and the plastic top hasn't. Yeah. 
So it, I they're, don't know different, if it's they're different. They're different materials. The lid needs to be a different stiffness, doesn't it? Because it, it needs to be more um, more malleable than the... But than it the says b- they're both dishwasher safe. Put them on the top. Bracket. No, I know, yeah, but fine, they but are dishwasher like safe. Dry. They are dishwasher safe. They're just not going to dry at the same. They, they'll have a different temperature well, type but threshold. I would like to know exactly why. Yeah, I'm telling you. Because... I'm telling you exactly why. <laughs> they have a different temperature threshold. And that's it, is it? That's why yeah, it doesn't matter. So why are you putting them in the dishwasher in the first place? Well, to get them clean. <laughs> It's better to have it clean and damp than dirty and and and, and not. But I, I'm not going to take. I'm I'm not taking a round of applause, Amelia. But if I tell you, <laughs> if that's not the correct answer, I will give you the money myself. Well, see if there is a reason why. Because of course, there's a reason why. Up the wall. There will be different. There will be different <laughs> compositions, different chemical compositions. What's the word I'm looking for? Like the boiling point or something. Like the drying point. The, the heat retention. <laughs> touch. Yeah, it is. Right. You don't laugh at me. It's a drying point. <laughs> no, type. Just, well, oh, all right. There it. we are. She's got her answer now because she's been cheering my ear off all morning. What, what's your mum's name? <laughs> Sarah. All right, Sarah. She's listening upstairs, but okay. she can't. All right, Sarah. <laughs> I'll try. Get, I'll get you a proper answer to this. But honestly, okay. you've completely changed my perceptions of Brentwood in the space for a single. <laughs> <rifle>. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. It's twenty-seven minutes after twelve. Ricky's in Edinburgh. Ricky, question or answer? I've got a question, James. Oh yeah. It's about albinoism. So last year I was out walking in Kent with my dog and I saw an albino squirrel and I was like, wow, an albino squirrel, that seems pretty amazing. I, I used to be the drummer for the albino squirrels. Did you? Well, That's okay. incredible. Well, anyway, Carry on. Carry on. Well, anyway, so then I met another dog, dog walker and I was like, wow, I've just seen an albino squirrel. And he was like, yeah, there's a family of them over there. And I was like, really? Well, that's quite something. And then I went to my friend's house and I said, wow, I've just seen an albino squirrel. And they went, yeah, I've got one in my freezer. What? And... Uh, yeah, they went and froze them, a dead frozen albino squirrel in their freezer. Why? So I was like, well, they actually had a uh, grey one, a white one, and they were looking for a red one because she was going to make a taxidermic triptych of squirrels. That's why. Oh, there you, are. Live, you live and learn, eh? Anyway, so my question is, presumably there's a propensity or a higher propensity amongst squirrels to be albino than there is maybe against other species. I don't know. So my question is, are some species have a higher propensity towards albinoism than others? That's my question. That was a brilliantly posed question and a really Thank interesting you. one as well. And in, indeed, did you know, Ricky, that I once ate a squirrel on, on live national television? No, I didn't know this. Oh, so it's a bit of an odd little avenue, career-wise. But, and, your, um, and your band, was that a punk band or something? Was no, it? I made that one up. That one was... Oh, did you? I, didn't, okay. I, I mean, it was what, a good name for a band, though. It's a brilliant name for a band, but if I had been in a band called the Albino Squirrels and then you rang in with a question about Albino Squirrels, that would have been a little bit uh, beyond... Yeah, yeah, b- yeah. Beyond belief. But, that, no, okay, so uh, the, 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 it's a genetic propensity, isn't it? It's a gene. It must oh, be a gene-based. Oh. So is it more it is pre- prevalent? Is it more prevalent in some species yeah, than so others? the guy that I met with the other dog, he said that there was a family of them, so presumably it is genetic. So presumably there was, you know... Yeah, but I wouldn't have thought both albinos. parents would be albino. Maybe one albino parent and all the all the pups were albinos. but Or albini, albino. Uh, but I don't know that both parents would have been. Do you? I don't know. That, I, I mean, I know nothing about it. It's why I'm finding you up. Finally... Did your friend ever find a red one? Well, so I live in Scotland, and yeah. they did come up to Scotland, and they did find some, but her partner wouldn't let, let her stop to pick one up. So at this moment in time, I'm not entirely sure whether they have the trip ditch, but trip they've ditch. definitely got... Word. Yeah, they've definitely got... Uh, they've definitely got two, and uh, they're looking for the third. Right, well, if anyone... It would be quite a cool, quite, quite a cool artwork, wouldn't it? You know? It would look pretty funky. If, so if, if anyone out there has got a frozen red squirrel and they don't know what to do with it, then <laughs> I, if you get in touch with me, I'll pass you on to Ricky. And Ricky will pass you on to his Perfect. friend. How's that? Yeah, great. That's great. nuts. Nice. All right. No, Cheers. Ricky, wait. I said that's nuts. Oh, that's no brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really brilliant if I have to point it <laughs> no, out. It's, ru- it's quite rubbish. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Half past 12 is the time. Jenny Barsby has your headlines. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. This is LBC. 12.32 is the time. David's been in touch. He says, James, I saw you eating a squirrel on the telly. What was it like? It was a bit like chicken, actually, would you believe? Um, I'm going to take a little swerve away from Mr. Hour. There's currently one phone line free if you want to get your question on the board or if you can answer the questions about churches and chimneys, about the sound of the sun, about the nuclear codes when the PMs change over, about the uh, registering of clowns' faces, about the origins of orange, uh, about the uh, heat retention or the drying, different drying differentials, different drying differentials, drying differentials of Tupperware in Brentwood, uh, and or even albino albinoism, albino squirrels in particular. But um, 
big story today about the COVID inquiry. The first report from the COVID inquiry, it won't be the last, has been um, released this morning. Well, released at 12 noon today. And, and I want to take a quick hit with Fraser Knight to find out some of the headlines. And then I know that Sheila Fogarty later this afternoon will be diving much deeper into the detail. Fraser joins me now live from Paddington. Fraser, what can you tell us? Well, James, this report sets out some of what we knew. We prepared for the wrong pandemic, for example, but it sets out in really stark terms that the UK government and the devolved administrations, Baroness Hallett says, failed their citizens. She said, we need a fundamentally new approach to preparing for pandemics and wider civil emergencies, so much so that she's almost putting the country and the governments on a a, a military footing. She says, we need to treat the threat of future pandemics in the same way that we do hostile states. And in this, she really criticises the lack of um, pandemic scenario planning that there was, a lack of economic preparation, and a damaging absence, she says as well, on the focus of interventions and infrastructure. And she says that the only plan that was in place was written in 2011 and it was ditched the second that COVID hit. The UK government's sole pandemic strategy from 2011 was outdated and lacked adaptability. It was never, in fact, properly tested. The UK government neither applied it nor adapted it and the doctrine doctrine that underpinned it was ultimately abandoned, as was the 2011 strategy itself. I have no hesitation in concluding that the processes, planning and policy of the civil contingency structures across the United Kingdom failed the citizens of all four nations. There were serious errors on the part of the state and serious flaws in our civil emergency systems. This cannot be allowed to happen again. Now, James, the report also talks about how ministers tried to game plan a a, a pandemic, albeit an influenza one. And it says in 2016, there were a number of recommendations that had come out of that to to implement by 2018. But by June 2020, just eight out of the 22 recommendations had been completed. Uh, And why was that? Well, it says one of the reasons for inaction was the competing demands of the preparations for a no deal Brexit operation yellow hammer and it oh says boy. the uk was reliant on stopping work on one potential emergency to try and concentrate on uh, another so really you know huge recommendations here from baroness hallett as well 10 recommendations made including this entirely new approach an independent group to look at how we prepare uh, and she says she wants to see governments get into work on that immediately to, to clarify would would we have been as you understand it and absolutely no problem at all if this is a, a, a silly or an unfair question. Would we have been in a much stronger position prior to 2011? Um, I think from what I understand, yeah. 2011 was really the only pandemic planning that we had uh, in place. Uh, but even in that, she says it just was, you know, it wasn't adaptable. There was no way of changing. Right. It, it was very specific. Uh, and clearly, as soon as COVID hit, completely different virus, it all went out the window. It didn't even look at the, the option of a lockdown, it really. It looked at, um, you know, the, the inevitability of of viruses spreading, but that was thrown out the window. We locked down, uh, and that, that that's where the, 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 this has all come from, really. Got it. Fraser Knight, great work. Live from Paddington, where Baroness Hallett and her colleagues have unveiled the first of their COVID reports, the, the consequences, the results, if you like, of that COVID inquiry. Uh, one headline already describing how government failed its citizens on COVID by planning for wrong pandemic report finds. Um, More on that with Sheila later this afternoon and quite possibly more on that with me tomorrow morning. 12.37 is the time. Back to the phones. Back to the phones. Lucy is in Stoke-on-Trent. Lucy, question or answer? I have a question, please, James. Carry on. How do noise-cancelling headphones work? I was reading about this today, would you believe? Because um, there was the name of the fellow who campaigned for Brexit and then moved all his business to Singapore. Dyson. Maybe not all his business, but I, and I think he's just laid off a thousand people in his British factories making making Britain great again. He's he's made some. And it, it, the, the bit that surprised me was it said they had 16 microphones in them. So the answer might have something to do with microphones, Lucy. But, but how does it confirm 
noise to not noise. Yeah, like, that, 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 that's the bit, isn't it? Because you can tell if you've got them on and you, you activate the noise cancelling, it's, it's, it's as if someone has sort of placed their hands over your ears. You can yeah, feel exactly. it from both sides. of the, I, d- I have absolutely yeah. no idea how it works. I can't believe it. And I'm... it doesn't always work brilliantly. Like, if you've got really loud noises, really sudden noises, it gums through, but it's kind of distorted, right? Yeah. So it's clearly doing something on a microphone level, but, but what and how? Well, that, that someone should be able to tell us, but I was bizarrely... Was that, did you see that story this morning? Is that where the question was prompted, or, or is that just a coincidence? That's just a coincidence. OK. Well, we like coincidences. 12.39 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, responses of bereaved families, of course, will be at the forefront of reaction to that COVID inquiry. Expect to hear uh, uh, some of that with with Sheila later, but that phrase failed citizens is the one that will be dominating the headlines for the rest of the day and indeed tomorrow. 12.39 is the time. Jackie's in Aberdeen. Jackie, question or answer? Answer. Carry on, Jackie. Clown face painting. Um, There's a lot of this in London. I seem to remember watching an uh, a TV article years ago. What they do, or what they did do when I watched the article was Paint the faces on eggs. On what? So if a, on eggs. 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 So yeah. Okay. So they, um, a clown would come in and they would, you know, paint the egg to what his face paint is, and then they would register it. Whether they've got a, they've updated it with digital technology now, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope not. It, I hope not. Don't you? I like the eggs. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, um, I'm of the same vintage as you, and I seem to remember it being a like maybe a blue blue Peter article or something oh, like that. Oh, how lovely! How lovely! Yeah. So yeah, they that's and it's a place in London. Like I said, they paint eggs, and they've got everybody from the, all the clowns from the past, all the great to the present. Liz and Truss, they, and they have to Jacob Rees Mogg. They they're all there, that. all there with their little faces well, painted on little eggs. Uh, and, and this is, I believe, the International Egg Registry, the Clowns International Egg Registry in London. Yeah, I presume so. Yeah, I presume so. And, it, and but it works. It's international, so all the clowns in the world have a little egg. Uh, can you visit it? Do we know if you can visit it? I don't. I don't, honestly don't know because, as I said. It's probably from Blue Peter back in the 80s. So. Those, are, those are the days. <laughs> right, well, qualifications, yeah. I saw it on Blue Peter. That's probably the most irrefutable qualification of them all. If you saw it on Blue Peter, there is no earthly way it's going to be wrong. Yeah, I'll, I, don't know whether I'll, uh, I don't know whether I'll get a Blue Peter badge for it. <laughs> <laughs> I got one somewhere, would you believe? I don't know where. It's one of those things that I sporadically find in a, in a mystery drawer every three or four years or so. I can't remember. I must. It can't be mine. I don't think it was mine. I've got a postcard of Shep somewhere. Which, uh, which they sent me after... No, Petra. Petra, who, who passed away, and everyone... I was very, very sad. So I wrote a letter of condolence to Peter Purvis, and they sent me a nice postcard of Petra in return. It's one of those moments, isn't it, where I'm thinking, what if you've just turned on the radio looking for some hard-hitting current affairs analysis? Um, Jackie, thank you. 12.41 is the time. Uh, yep, yeah, and Tom is in Hopton-on-Sea in Norfolk. Whereabouts in Norfolk is that? I've not heard of it before. Hopton-on-Sea is between Lowestoft and Goulston. Oh, so Suffolk Norfolk borders then? Yeah, it used to be in Suffolk, but then they took it to Norfolk somehow. They changed the border. Okay, uh, yeah, but so way that, before my time. Well, I, d- I don't know that end as, that well as, as well as I do further further north. But, um, question yeah, or answer? There's a Hayden camp there anyway. That's nice. Question or answer? <laughs> uh, question, unfortunately. No, we like questions. Don't be silly. Well, there's been too many questions. Um, oh, everyone's a critic. You... <laughs> Go <laughs> on. Um, can young children see better in the dark than adults? Do we lose our sight of the well, being in the dark? Well, they, I mean, it may not be a specific question about darkness. G- generally speaking, uh, age, age-related age sort of decline in sight is going to apply in the dark and in the light, isn't it? Well, I don't know. It's just that when I tuck my three-year-old in and have to do that classic of creeping out of the room... Yeah. I'm bashing into every bookcase, toy, and anything that's on the floor to get to the um, yeah. to get to the door. But then, when I watch her on the camera when she get up, she sort of walks straight round stuff, over stuff. Yeah, but she's had time. She's had time to get used to it by then. 
Ah, well, it's like my ten-month-old as well. When we watch her and she can, oh, she can sweet, grab the it? dummies wherever they are in the bed. She just grabs them straight away. But when I'm in there, I'm feeling around the bed and can't find them anywhere. But yeah. she seems to all find right. them straight okay. away. I mean, I suspect it will be the same answer that to, 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 to daylight in in light as it is in dark. That they're just uh, the younger you are, the better your eyes are. But I will put the specific question on the board. Twelve forty-three is the time. Um, I, I think in response to Tom's rather constructive criticism, I should remind you of the questions that still need answers because there are as he alluded to quite a lot of them are you ready why aren't there any chimneys in churches does the sun make a sound when prime ministers change what happens to the nuclear codes during the little bit when no one is prime minister done the clown faces laura's question answered by jackie uh what came first the orange or orange Tupperware question? We haven't done the Tupperware. Why do the lids on the Tupperware in the dishwasher not dry as effectively as the pots or the boxes? The containers is the word that I'm looking for. Is albinoism more prevalent in some species than others, with particular reference to squirrels? And can children see in the dark better than what adults can? Uh, Cheryl's in Edenbridge. Cheryl, question or answer? It's an answer. Carry on. It's about the squirrels. Oh, yes. Um, I don't believe that albinoism is more prevalent in squirrels, but um, I think the animals to which your caller was referring are not albinos. (gasps) Dun, dun, dun! (laughs) They are leucistic, um, which means they're not devoid of all pigment. They just are like washed out versions. So they have very pale markings and fur relevant to their species, but they are not, they don't have red eyes. They're not completely devoid of pigment. Um, And you get this in other species too. So like you can get leucistic badges. They still have stripes, but they're just very pale. Just paler, just generally paler. It's like a genetic pigmentation type situation. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why you get several of them in one place is because as opposed to albinos, who don't, I don't believe, do very well in the wild. Right. Um, I think... Well, they wouldn't, would they? Animals, no, exactly. And For I think predation. The animals are able to just carry on pretty much as others. And also because I think because they don't have pigment, they don't do well in the sun, etc. I know um, how they feel. <laughs> but uh, with the leucistic animals, I think they're pretty much breed as others do if they don't get predated. And, Which is why there's a little so, family. Someone sent me a picture, exactly. actually, from Gildredge Park in Eastbourne. That was from Don. Don sent me and a they're, lovely picture. They're very striking, white, white yeah. squirrels, we must call them, or leucistic yeah. squirrels. Qualifications? They're very, they're, uh, well, I live in the area where there are quite a few, and um, have other species too, so there are leucistic pheasants around here, um, and I've definitely seen quite a few squirrels, and also deer. We've got quite a few deer. Can you get albino oh, polar bears? <laughs> How would you know? Oh, well, you it'd be the eyes, eyes, wouldn't it? John's asked that question, <laughs> but I don't think he's being entirely serious. Round of applause for Cheryl, please. <laughs> it's 12.46. Mystery Hour on LBC with James O'Brien. 12.48 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, let's crack on with some answers, hopefully, to the questions. Mark is in Shoreham on sea. Mark, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. Uh, it's the sound uh, sound cancellation. Yeah, go on. Um, sound cancellation works on the principle of one sound wave cancelling another. Um, basically, your headphones record um, the noise that is around you that you don't want, the white noise, the uh, whatever. Yeah. And then when you press noise cancellation, it plays it back into the headphones, and the sound waves are identical, and they cancel each other out. That's why they've got microphones. Absolutely. 
That's mad. Uh, it's, to, it's, to, it's to record the noise. Uh, if you get, uh, I explained to your producer, if you get two speakers on a system and plug them both into, say, the left or the right-hand yeah. channel instead yeah. of having left and right, and you face them towards each other, and you slowly push them together, yeah. there'll be a point where you you can't hear either speaker. Shut up! Because yeah, no, seriously, because the the, the sound it's waves a party will trick, isn't it? collide. Yeah, the sound waves collide and, and literally cancel each other out. Good lord! Uh, this, this and the short answer to use. say why are some noise cancelling headphones much better than others? It will be the number and the quality of the microphones that they've got. Absolutely, yes. Well, that is an absolute yeah, um, education. What are your qualifications, Mark? Uh, I work for BMW loudspeakers, uh, Bowles and Wilkins um, Research Centre, uh, doing prototype work for a uh, for a top consultant. Sweet as a nut. Um, what's the next big thing? In, what's, the, what's the next big thing in audio technology? Oh, that I can't tell you because I haven't been there for a while. Now. Oh, right. um, I thought you were going to do the official years, secret sadly. act, the official sadly sound not. secret no. <laughs> act. I, I could give you a round of applause. I, I, I you know, the normal though. That's lovely. No, thank you. Thank you. If you want to cancel that out, then you need to get a round of applause from over there and then sort of push them together. Yeah, science, that is. Nathan's in Northampton. Nathan, question or answer? No, it's an answer. Carry on, Nathan. Um, So the nuclear launch codes. Yeah. When we changed Prime Minister, we do not use nuclear launch codes like the Americans. Yeah. We we have the... This might not change the actual question, though. No. So what happens is each Prime Minister at the start of their term has to write letters of last resort. So these are letters that are given to the uh, the nuclear submarines. Yeah. Um, so in the event that they are themselves incapacitated to give the order, um, the submarine commanders are to open these letters. And in that letter, they'll be instructed, you know, what, what, what to do. Do they surrender to a NATO country and let them have control of the nuclear warheads? Do they decide upon themselves to retaliate on the enemy? And would that apply in the... So you've got two letters essentially and there'll be a, there won't be a moment where, where, where neither letter is in place? Yeah. So I open That's the letter yeah. so there's a, there's, a, there's a missile coming towards me. I open the yeah. letter and it says in the event of a missile coming towards you, do this. Yeah, exactly that. So, okay. well, no, so what it would be is in the event that you cannot get hold of the chain of command, yeah, then you you are to do. I, I instruct you to do this. Okay, and until that letter is, re- that is your they are your okay. orders. Okay, qualifications. Um, none relating to that. I'm ex police, and I was a um, negotiator. But where, how did you find out that little nugget of information? Uh, it was just a point of interest when I was younger. I wanted to join the yeah, navy, but enough. it just never worked out. I like it. All right, at least I got you a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Robin's in West Wickham. Robin, question or answer? It's an answer, James, Carry to on. the sun. Carry on. Um, basically, why we can't hear the sun. I mean, the sun is uh, a big ball of nuclear reactions. It makes a huge amount of sound. And if we could, if the sound waves could travel to us, we would hear it all day, every day, and it would be very annoying, I could imagine. And the reason we can't is simply the same reason that you, as to why no one can hear you scream in space. It's a vacuum. Space is a vacuum, which means sound waves can't travel through it. There's nothing for them to travel through. So it is making and a noise, but we would never hear it. It's making a huge... I, I did read um, how <laughs> loud it is, but I can't remember what it is, but it is very, very loud. It, I mean, if you imagine... It's the size nuclear of explosions. Of it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. It would be so loud, it would be um, oppressively loud. But luckily for us, it's, there's a vacuum, so the sound waves need to travel through something. There's nothing for them to travel through, which is why sound doesn't, um, doesn't move through space. Qualifications! Um, I read it in New Scientist magazine a few years ago. And that is also why, in space, no one can hear you scream. Yes, indeed. L- round of applause for Robin, please. Thank you. I love it, Robin. Uh, Lee's in Belfast. Lee, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. So plastic, uh, it's the plastic lids question. So whenever you're washing something in a washing machine, it gets water. And then whenever it's going to be dry, essentially what happens is that the idea, the item will keep the heat and allow the water to evaporate while it's cooling off. The problem is thin plastic has what we call a low heat density, which means it can't <laughs> keep heat. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, carry on. It can't keep heat that well. So the wa- so it's losing a lot of that heat that would allow the water to evaporate off. 
and essentially the water is staying on the plastic lid because it's just that thin and just that bad of the material. So, it's, so, be, so it's the it's the the thickness more than anything else. They might even be made from the same material, but but the but they, the physical properties, the thickness of the lid, means that it's going to have a lower heat density than than the container. Both the lid and the container are probably both made from a plastic called polypropylene, and it will be thicker for the container and thinner for the lid. And that's why one has higher heat density than the other. What a beautiful answer. Qualifications? Uh, my master's thesis was in polypropylene, and this was an issue I encountered Shut once. Shut the front door. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Fantastic. Um, it was to do with recycling polypropylene. Uh, well, you got your round of applause. How many people would have done a master's thesis in the field of polypropylene? Let's see, there were 72 chemical engineers in my master's year, and two people did that, so uh, probably... Quite a few, worldwide. Very, very few people, probably, actually. <laughs> well, how many nationwide, do you think? If I were to take an educated guess, probably yeah. 500, maybe, ish, mm, maybe so less. Much. You talked yourself out of a Ray Liotta there, unfortunately, because we all like a Ray Liotta, and your name is Lee, so it would have had an extra resonance, but on we go. Uh, Ed's in Shepherd's Bush. Ed, question or answer? It's an answer, James. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> it's all about the noise cancelling headphones. Yeah. Uh, the previous uh, caller, he forgot. He forgot to say something. I think rather than getting it wrong. But just just fill in the gap quickly if you can. Exactly. He needed to say that the um, the, the the sound wave that's played back has to be inverse yeah. to the one coming in, so yeah. they cancel each other out. Yeah. And, 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 and he didn't say that, but I think he, he clearly knew it. He just, um, just just omitted to mention it. What are your qualifications? Um, I do music production as a, as a hobby. Oh, fantastic. You can have a round of applause as well. <laughs> Neil's in block switch. Neil, question or answer? Uh, answer. Carry on. Uh, it's to the orange thing. The short answer is the, the fruit definitely came first. Yeah. Um, and it comes from an old word. I can't remember the language, and I had to resist the urge to Google it. Fair enough, don't my worry. Memory. Um, it came from the word naranga, which is something to do with, it either just means fragrant or it means fragrant fruit. Right. Uh, so the fruit, when it came to, Sp uh, to um, France in particular, was called naranga, and they dropped the N, Aranga. Yeah. When the fruit came to English-speaking countries, presumably from France, because, you know, we were French and all that, um, it was it got corrupted to orange. Before that, the only colour, if, if orange did appear in nature, which is rare, it was just called red or yellow red. Yeah. So then they needed a new word. So around the same time, I think pumpkins uh, appeared as well, so which are also orange. So they started calling them orange red. And uh, then just got the red point and became orange. There you go. Which is why go on. ginger people are called redheads because that name predates the colour orange. Qualifications? I'm, I'm ginger and someone pointed it out, so I looked into <laughs> it. Round of applause. Ginger power. <laughs> uh, Clinton's in Lincoln. Clinton, question or answer? We're knocking him it's out of the park answer. now. Come on, come on, Clinton. <laughs> it's an answer to the church heating question. Yes. Um, churches did have chimneys. What? Yes, they had chimneys because they all used to heat their spaces with coal, uh, usually through great big cast iron pipes under grids in oh, the floor. I've seen those. Ah, but I... when the coal boilers became obsolete, they abandoned the chimneys and a lot of them were taken down because of course they cost a lot of money to maintain so so churches find... were heated is the short answer to the question yes so you will find a lot of churches that have got big old obsolete coal, coal boilers still in the cellar but they've, they haven't been used for decades crypt i prefer crypt. <laughs> qualifications crypt. And my dad was a vicar, and I used to be the manager at a company called Heating Replacement Parts and Controls. Oh, that's the perfect qualification. For, I'm going to. I'm tempted to, to, to. My dad was a vicar, and I used to work in heating, answering a question about heating in churches. Yeah, go on. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it, <laughs> they will come. It's the perfect qualification. I know. I don't know how many people. Uh, I'm going to give the game to. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Amelia in Brentwood gets the go. As long as she shares it with Sarah. There we go. That's it from me for another day. We'll do it all. Oh, champing, champing, champing is camping in churches.
You, there's a whole organisation. You can camp in churches. You can travel around the country, camp in a church. If you miss any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you'll also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as all of Global's live radio stations. So do download Global Player for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, Ben Kentish is standing in for Tom Swarbrick, who is, of course, standing in for Nick Ferrari, who is on holiday. But now it's Sheila Fogarty. You're so good at those. Thanks. It's years, a bit like years you, you, of practice. You know the way um, Claudia Winkleman brought the terms and conditions to life on Strictly. Yes, indeed. I, I feel similar. Wow, similar vibes going on praise, there. High praise. Thank you, James. It's 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 high praise. Thank you, James. 